Good morning, everyone. So good morning. Uh, thank you to you all to be there, either here in Angoulême or online. We are followed by uh, also a bunch of, of people there. So uh, I welcome you in the name of the old CNA management to this final oral presentation of the M2 projects of this cohort P P17. Oops, didn't switch it on. So first of all, many thanks to the jury to be there. Um, so you are representatives of uh, uh, a lot of actors of the video game industry. So we're really glad to uh, glad and honored to welcome you here. So thank you for your uh, involvement in this process. And as usual, I will ask you to, to be there to share your feedbacks and ask your final questions concerning the projects we're going to see today. You will also have to complete the evaluation file. You received the link. And today also to do evaluation. I will come back to that a bit later. So as usual, I will ask you to raise your hands and also to uh, repeat your names and the company you work for. Uh, so it will be... Uh, easier for the for the students to to see who's speaking to them. So thanks again to be there and uh, welcome again. So today, uh, as a remember a reminder, the M2 projects uh, are uh, led by six teams of nine to twelve students. Uh, they are organized as studios and they worked on the conception and pre-production phase of a whole game. So we're going to see six games presented today, as usual. Uh, they have had four months to do that. Uh, so it started the 18th of October, and now we are four, four months later at the final presentation. And they're going to show us the results of this work. The criteria for the evaluation are uh, originality, interest, and feasibility of the project quality and interest of the vertical slice, relevance and quality of the oral presentation. But enough about this talk. Let's uh, welcome the P17 cohort and the first team. And let's go. <laughs> so tribe of, tribe of Down, it's your turn. Hello, we are Tribe of Dawn. We are a nomadic strategic survival game focusing on movement and spiritual connection. Here's the premise. All tribes were disbanded except for the nomadic Tribe of Dawn. And the role of this remaining tribe will be to help the others. This is our long-term goal. And the core gameplay, as the teaser uh, suggested, will involve fleeing the dangerous night and staying in motion and protecting the sacred beast our tribe lives on. The need for perpetual movement must exert a slight but permanent pressure. This is not a game about extension. There is scarcity, limited building possibilities, and the population of the tribe will not expand. This pressure should strengthen the bond which connects the tribe and its creature. They live in close symbiosis and they need each other. 
Finally, this connection should gradually expand to other humans and creatures outside the tribe, leading to the feeling that everything is tied together and spiritually connected. But how is it played exactly? When discovering Tribe of Dawn, the first thing we should experience is movement. And the first thing we should learn is how to sustain this movement in order to survive. The controls are classic RTS style. We manage three pilgrims as well as the creature itself. The pilgrims can harvest two kinds of resources, coral, which allows them to feed the creature, and fruit, which sustains the tribe's activity. They have limited energy, which will decrease when they are away performing tasks and increase when they come closer to the creature and rest. Once we've learned the basics of survival, we will encounter another creature which was abandoned by its pilgrims and seems to be in really bad shape. This is a dreadful sight, but we are not able to help it yet. We have to prepare so that the next time we see the creature, we might do something. This leads us to the first advanced mechanic, buildings. Um, in Trade of Dawn, the player is able to construct unique buildings that should help uh, to focus on a specific playstyle. The number of buildings that the creature can carry is limited to three, and the more buildings you construct on its back, the slower it gets due to its weight. The Tribe of Dawn lives in a scarcity and, nobi and nobilism, um, so the player has to handle these constraints. Uh, the three buildings allow for different places that, that we can see here. For effectiveness, choose the medical launch, which will allow the pilgrims to regain energy faster. For security and planning, choose the training launch, which will allow the pilgrims to gather resources faster. And for exploration, choose the artisanal launch, which expands the energy, lim energy limits, um, allowing them to go further away. Um, each of them has a building cost in coral, an upkeep in fruit, and a lifetime. So some are permanent and some are not. The player is expected to build some buildings in the right gameplay situation to get the most value out of the investment. Um, we also design a handful of other buildings, which would appear in the full game, but not in the vertical slice. For this short experience, we prefer to focus on the core elements, but the main idea of different playstyle remains. Once we've learned how to build, we can learn about a second advanced mechanic, the prayers. Prayers galvanize the tribe and focus its energy on specific tasks. There's always a prayer active, but they have really different effects and downsides, so we will have to switch often. They also have a strong importance for the game's music and for the game's narration, since they will be the main source of information about the lore. That's something we'll get back to later. The prayers bear the names of the gods they are addressed to, and will give the tribe one of the gods' characteristics. Axo will give us speed, but consume resources. F2 will allow us to perform rituals, but stop the creature. Olbu will allow us to save resources, but it will make us slower. The game's music system is based around this mechanic. The basis layer, cello and piano and drums, as well as the chord progression and rhythm are driven by the biome. And on top of that, we can dynamically add our prayer layer. This, for example, is Axel's prayer, centered around speed. At any time, we can switch to another prayer. This is Olbu's prayer, centered around scarcity. And finally, F2, the prayer centered around rituals. We also designed a more complex version of this system, which was more suited to the full game rather than the 10 minute slides. In a longer experience, it would be nice to gather parts of prayers and assemble them to compose exactly the prayer we need. Since you would learn them from the other tribes and creatures, it would also imply that although all tribes are part of a larger culture, each of them bring, brings something new. And as we assemble the puzzle of this oral tradition, we also discover its var variety. So let's make a short recap and it will be an opportunity to introduce the user interface. This is a view of our vertical slice. We have to move the pilgrims and the creature on the land. That's why on the left there are icons for all of them. The pilgrims have health bars, 
showing their current level of exhaustion. We can monitor our current stocks of coral and fruit on the top of the screen. On the right, a small camera shows the current buildings we have on the creature's back. If we click it, the building menu opens and the camera switches to building mode. At the bottom, there's a widget showing the current active prayer, as well as the lyrics which are currently sung. If we click it, the widget opens and allows us to change the current prayer. Finally, because that's a lot to manage and the gyre never stops, we also added a pause button, mainly for accessibility reasons. So we have resource management and some advanced mechanics helping us maintain our movement, but where's the challenge? Once we are familiar with these mechanics and we start accumulating resources, what happens? At this point, we will start encoding asynchronous pilgrims. They were separated from their tribe, they are disoriented and unable to survive, but they are still trying. So they will come and steal coral from us. We can ch chase them away to protect our coral, but it won't solve the problem. What could solve the problem is our last advanced mechanic, the ritual dances. Ritual dances are a micromanagement mechanic which allows to heal these poor beings so that they become able to connect with a creature again and form a new tribe. As you can see in this GIF, we just have to select several units and assign them to an asynchronous pilgrim. They will start dancing around them, and once they have performed a full loop, the asynchronous pilgrim will be healed. If three pilgrims al are healed, they will go back to a creature and form a new tribe. These rituals are tied to the prayers. We can dance unless there's a specific prayer uh, song, and the movements of the pilgrims will embrace its rhythm. We now have all the tools in hand. We are finally able to save the creature we met at the beginning. We've been working for quite some time now, and we have performed a full loop around this small planet. We are back to the exact same point we started from. This means we will soon meet the distressed creature again. If we have saved enough pilgrims, or if we save them right now, we will be able to connect to, they will be able to connect to it and form a new tribe and take care of this creature like we have taken care of ours. This is a successful macro loop of Tribe of Dawn's gameplay. But there will be more than one loop, so here's an overview of our full timeline. Let's begin with the situation. Not long before the game begins, the Jaya emerges. This powerful, mysterious entity causes the tribes to lose their connection and split, leaving their sacred beasts isolated. Since uh, th this is the moment when the game begins. Since the Tribe of Dawn is nomadic, uh, it was able to avoid the night, and it's now the only surviving tribe. So it will have to help the others reunite. Every time it saves a tribe, it learns a new prayer from it, recollecting the oral knowledge of this shared civilization. Eventually, when they have gathered all these ancient words, they will be able to perform a final ritual, which will cause the Jaya to disappear. This is when the full game would end. The slice represents the first minutes of it. The slice and the game begin at the same point, but the slice ends just after the first healing. Before we show the slice to you, let's dive a bit further into Tribe of Dawn's environment. So, about the game's world. The environment of the game is composed of three biomes, each with their own identity and gameplay elements. They were inspired by sensations like the fluffy hills, large soft meadows full of resources and easy to walk through. The discus mangrove, lost forest that slows the creature down, and the red salt mountains that we chose to develop in our vertical slice. It's the most balanced biome in terms of gameplay. This environment is made of redstone relief, high and low, and is covered of snow. We must figure out a way across, go around holes, and avoid mountains. It gives a fair share to level design, and it has just the resource we need to start the game. Here is the biome as rendered within the game. We created vertical tiles to allow relief to be made on the map. As you can see, we wanted the hand-painted effect on the texture for a warmer art direction. And here are the asynchronous soul 
that have been caught in the gyre and that we have going to help. The village is built on a creature's back, always moving. The buildings need to be lightweight and femoral and flexible enough to follow the creature's heavy walk. It's inspired by vernacular anti-seismic architecture and uses elements we can see both on the creature and the pilgrims, like ropes, linen and bones, to emphasize the bond between them. The, character you see, the characters you see on the left are the other cast of the tribe living only inside the village, performing prayer and taking care of the building. Let's talk about our creature that will support the village. It's ancient, alien. We don't know if it's organic or mineral, and it looks like a divinity. Is it the tribe's god? We wanted to keep this uncanny feeling toward the creature, yet we can still witness the organic bond it has with the tribe. Finally, concerning the tribe itself, here are the pilgrims, explorers and gatherers. The player will manage three of them. They are humanoids the player can identify with who are in symbiosis with the creature. So we use the same visual element as for the creature to display the common origin. Bones, fur and tentacle, as well as the ropes and knots used to climb around the back of the creature and then symbolize the vital link they share. These characters have their own language, which is called Amla. We recorded their voices, voice lines and their prayers, to which we added English subtitles. There are several reasons which led us to develop this original language. We wanted to give these characters more depth, they have a whole culture, while also making them feel a bit obscure to the player at first. We don't know their culture yet, and it's not a culture which exists on Earth. Finally, we thought it would be quite cool, and in fact, some of you have been very curious about this aspect, so we decided to dive a bit deeper into its details. To build the tribe's vocabulary, we started with basic elements of meaning. We associated vowels to ideas and consonants to contexts. By connecting an idea to a context, we could create a syllable with a specific meaning. For example, at the intersection of U, the vowel associated with the idea of life, and R, the consonant associated with the idea of space, there is the syllable ur, which means land. And it reminded us of our land, a cool engine project from a few years ago. Big thanks to the team members who shared their ex experience and advice with us, by the way. So now that we know how to build words, we can discover the fundamental uh, Amla vocabulary. Aksha is the name for tribe, any tribe. Ak means group, and Sha means synchronization. Kuo Haksha is the specific name for the tribe of Down. As you've probably guessed, Kuo means Down. Every tribe lives on an airpark, a sacred beast. Roughly, it means sacred moving symbiote. Within the tribe, there are Uram, people of the land, the pilgrims who explore the area, and Uyam, people of the familiar place, the dwellers who stay on the creature, erect buildings, and sing the Nachab the prayers which guarantee the tribe's cohesion. This word blends devotion, synchronization, and rite. Epshab is very similar. Basically, it's also a ritual, but it incorporates dance. It is performed on uh, the asynchronous uh, pilgrims, the obnok, which means cursed with division. And this curse is caused by the dangerous jaya, obfe, and part of this enigmatic word seems to originate from a different, older language, and its meaning was lost. So just before going into prayers, after writing and recording those parts, this is what it sounds like in-game. And at the center of this vast culture, there are the prayers, an old tradition transmitting tales and advice cycle after cycle. When the core language was ready and the music structure was thought out, Pierre Emmanuel, the composer, uh, Antoine and I, incorporated the prayers into songs and recorded them. 
Here we can see the third verse of a prayer known as Nimble Axo, which is origi with, with its original text in yellow and its English translation in white. It describes the sacred beast's endless run. Let's listen to it. Okay, let's talk a bit about user research. Thank you. Uh, we made and will make resources on user experience through the project. It will describe, I will describe a bit of the methodologies we used for this goal. Uh, first of all, uh, playtests. Playtests are, of course, an important point for an iterative game development. We already made several playtests that helped us uh, to take a lot of important de decisions. Uh, we used and we will use two types of prototypes for playtests. Firstly, paper prototypes. Um, they take a small amount of time to produce and to set up, and thus are perfect to test new mechanics. Uh, it is well adapt for adapted for short iteration on gameplay and can give us results quite fast. On the other hand, a uh, classic build on PC. Of course, it takes more time to produce a PC build, but it's, it is the best option to test the final game at, at its closest. So it's a perfect occasion to test uh, the final user experience and uh, to test uh, the pillars, the atmospheres, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, just a, a few talk about accessibility. It was uh, accessibility was an important aspect for us, so we decided to take it into account for the development of the game. You may show show it a bit in the user interface, but it was more vast than that. Uh, our main focus is was the multiplicity of uh, visual and audio feedbacks but also making the game playable only with the mouse or only with the keyboard. Uh, some of these features will be implement, uh, are implemented in the vertical slice, uh, slice, like Antoine said, for example, uh, the pause button, while others will be up for the final game. And in the same way, uh, as we wanted to make the, uh, the, uh, the game as an accessible strategy game, we designed it on onboarding that accompanies the first experience of the player. So now let's talk about why, ch why choose tribe, tribe of Down. Sorry. So first of all, Tribe of Down have an original world uh, with a personal art artistic direction. Uh, our mechanics support each other in a ori original way, which gives the game a unique gameplay. Uh, despite this interaction, uh, our game is beginner friendly thanks to few characters to control. So um, this is how we can represent Tribe of Down on a diagram. Uh, medium micro management due to few amount of characters, as I said. Uh, focus on resource management and mystical ambience of the world. A strong narrative story and a positive feeling with no violence in the game. So as you've probably understood, this makes Tribe of Down unique compared to its competitors. Uh, we are mainly aimed at story lovers beginners, RTS players, and casual gamers, without leaving other players on the bench, of course. So here you have some examples of uh, our competitors. So uh, some of them uh, start, uh, well, launched uh, at the beginning of uh, 2000, and others are quite new. So just a few words about how to produce and finance Drive of Down. So here is an overview of the world map. Uh, as you can see, we need three more months to remove our last uncertainties. The production should take around 10 months, and we plan to get an open beta to polish the game as much as possible before the launch. The last months will be dedicated to launch support. Here uh, is a production unit for a biome. As you can see, we need four, five months to create a full biome. The two first biome will be developed simultaneously and should not exceed six months, considering that the first biome will be pretty advanced thanks to the uh, pre-production phase. We've estimated the cost of a biome for approximately 100,000 euros, so now you know what adding content might represent. So, as you might expect for this kind of game, uh, the staffing will uh, decrease as soon as we've ended the second biome and start the third one. 
We've estimated the production costs for less than 500,000 euros. Uh, we plan to sell the game for uh, 1599 on Steam, uh, which is uh, the low price for this kind of game. Our competitor sales are estimated between 200,000 and a billion of copies uh, uh, based on Steam Spy. And if we sell at least half of the lower sales of our competitors, uh, we can expect to be cost effective for uh, six, uh, 60, sorry, 100, 000, sorry, 60,000 copies. And things are getting more interesting as soon as uh, we reach uh, a, a better estimation. For example, uh, if we reach 100,000 uh, copies sales, we can have a return on investment of 0 0.7. So other examples, of course. Uh, we would like to get published uh, to get a publisher specialized in indie games uh, used to engage a medium budget in production game with a strong ma marketing uh, knowledge and uh, um, an international out out sorry outreach. We think that it will allow us to develop Tribe of Dawn and could help us uh, to develop other games. We think. We think that Publisher has uh, head up uh, Play Digius or Shiro uh, Unlimited will be able to work with us and w the development support they can provide will help us a lot for balancing. The remaining budget uh, needed could uh, be con converted uh, by public's help and banks. So now let's take a look at what we already have. So this is our tribe, and this is a Jaya. You have to keep the movement to in aim to survive. Yeah. I will remember you some important elements of the presentation, like the author's classic control. You can click on your units of pilgrims, the creature, and yeah. also the icon to yeah. move them anywhere. You can collect resources, the swamp fruits, to maintain your building activity and the coral okay. to feed your creator. Okay. on the back of the crater. You have a several slot and several buildings. Each one has a cost, an upkeep, and a durability. And now we are going to build a medicinal lodge. It will decrease the energy depletion of your pilgrims. Now at the time you encounter your first instantaneous pilgrim. You want to feel it, so you uh, switch the prayer to practice some devout F2 to, to, so to, pray, to perform a ritual dance. For our prayer system, there is this tab, this tab on the left bottom of the screen. You have to switch to select the different prayers. So Devat F2 for the ritual, you can perform ritual, but you stop your creature and ascetical boo and you is you can walk but that consume resources. He's taking his time 
you know, all roads lead to the synchronous creator. Maybe you notice with the skeleton we already do one full turn of our teeny planet. Once again we begin a ritual. So we switch we switch to Devat F2 prayer and we begin to hear the second a second pilgrim. We are quite close from the Jaya. It's beginning to be dangerous, so we switch to Nibble Axel Prayer. The crater is faster, but it consumes twice the coral as normal. Also, we send our pilgrims too far from us, so they are tired and they are slow, very slow. We switch to Ascetic Orbu to have a normal walk. Okay, so we check, we have saved. To a synchronous pilgrim, we have to find the last one, and then we can heal the asynchronous creature. Remember, it is a long-term goal of our vertical slice. take a little advance so we have the time to do a little detour to collect resources that can be useful if you want to build or just to sustain your movement in a difficult moment And now we met the last asynchronous pilgrim. He's really disturbed. I want to steal your coral. And to avoid that, to, to you can send your pilgrim and they fear you. We are going to speed the movement and then to practice the ritual. It's pretty dangerous because we are close from the Jaya. At this moment, we succeed to heal the three asynchronous pilgrims so they will perform their own ritual dances to heal their creature. And at this point, you succeed to finish our vertical slice. Congratulations.
I want you to present the team. We have Armel, Alice and Alice as a 3D artist, Ace, Antoine and I as game designer, Antonin as sound designer, Clara as U UI designer, Valentin as UX and UR designer, Guillaume as project manager, Basil, Aurélien and Leo as programmer, and we welcome in our team two talented people that, is, that are Pierre Manuel as composer and Jan as UI designer. We invited you to, uh, at a lunch break to test our game on the Plateau project, and we want to thank the pedag pedagog pedagogical team, the professional team, and also you, the jury, to advise us and to support us during this four months of work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to start? Questions, comments? I'm just looking also online. Yes, La Laura, you want to start? Hi, uh, yeah, you can hear me. Um, so hi, Laura from, well, head of, uh, head of production at Playdigious. Um, first of all, congratulations on the presentation. Uh, it was really great. We see all the improvements made, you've made since the last time. So well done there. Um, I have two questions actually. Um, first one is, have you thought about mobile as a platform? Because the interface, the interface seems, well, really mobile friendly. Uh, you just have to make a few adjustments and it could be really quick to, to be there. Um, and second question is, how long would be the game? Are we more around one, two hours or 10, 15 hours? W what is your expectation here? Uh, with the features we have currently designed, it will be quite short, like between two and four maybe. There will be more diversity. Uh, the, the tribes and the creatures will be different. Uh, but yeah, it stays uh, quite a short experience. And um, yeah, we, we didn't really uh, envision a, a mobile version, uh, mostly because uh, RTS are very rare for the moment on mobile, but that's true that we wanted a simple version of the RTS, so it will be interesting to explore this, uh, this quite new area of uh, RTS uh, mobile games. Uh, none, of us, uh, none of our references uh, were mobile games, so we should have made some research on this. Uh, and yeah, if we engage in a more lengthy production, we will probably uh, go look for references of mobile RTS and try to find a way to make this work for us. Yes, good idea, thank you. Thank you. Odile, you have a question as well. Um, hello, yes, I'm Odile from Colon Game Lab, professor for economics. And um, actually, it was a, I wanted to say it's a very, very professional presentation. Congratulations. Um, the whole structure were very good um, that you can really follow everything and understand everything. So really well done on this. I have only two very small things. Um, at the beginning, I think your video was nice, but didn't tell me much about your game. It didn't make me curious. It's just, just a nice video to watch. So I think this is something you should work on that it really makes the, the, the viewer curious about what is going to come because then you really catch my attention for the presentation. And at the end, I would I wish a little bit less maybe on the language and more on the economic side, on the marketing, on the USPs. You had very general USPs um, and uh, it was not something really special to your game. I think you have a very clear concept now and you could have worked a little bit more about what is exactly the special to your game. But uh, as a overall, very good impression. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this feedback. Um, hi, uh, Jaime from Utah, Madrid. First of all, congratulations because the change of the project since the start point until now is simply amazing. What you have been able to do, even creating your own language, is a work that Tolkien will be proud of. So congratulations for that, not an easy work. And also the implementation of sound and even the lyrics, I think that it says a lot. Even 
it says a lot about the society that you have created. Um, but at the same time, I think that I can agree with something that has been said. Because, for example, uh, the challenges and the obstacles and the enemies weren't exactly clear. How are you going to manage the difficulty of your game? How are you going to increase that difficulty? It's not exactly clear. Um, with for, for example, Javier and I, we're also uh, talking about um, the AI of the enemies that weren't perfectly sewn <laughs> in the case of the vertical slice. And at the same time, we think that it's a really important thing. Also, uh, we would like to know if there will be um, also, uh, there is an amount of resources in each stack that is around the world. Is the number of those resources going to change depending on the biome or also depending on the difficulty? How are you going to manage to make the game interesting through the development of it? First, uh, that's true that we need um, more time to work on the uh, artificial intelligence to make the enemies more dangerous. Uh, and they would also get more numerous with time. Uh, there is the, the biomes that we didn't develop in the vertical slice but will be in the full game and that would add difficulty first because some of them slow you down and uh, second because uh, all the resources aren't in all the biomes so you have to make choices and you will really um, feel the scarcity of resources if you have taken a path uh, and you lack something. There will be also a third resource, the linen that it is used to build the so the resource management will be a little harder and finally, there's something that we didn't develop uh, because we lacked time, but in an idea that we had at the beginning was uh, events. Uh, when you have made a, a certain um, amount of turns around the planet, there would be uh, semi-random events uh, adding difficulty to the survival part of the game. So you have to prepare partly because there will be this kind of things happening. Hello, um, Alex, uh, lead artist at Ubisoft Bordeaux. Um, congratulations on the work. Um, you developed a pretty interesting vertical slice. Um, just a, a few remarks. Um, uh, you have a very interesting universe, all right? The base of everything is pretty cool, very mystical, very spiritual and stuff. Um, for an advice, if you choose to continue your work a little bit, just to push a bit further. Um, the environment right now um, f like doesn't show um, the potential of your universe. Um, the, um, like for example, you have like uh, an environment that is basically a snow biome. Uh, you don't feel the cold, you don't see the wind. Um, and I regret that um, uh, in your concept art, you had a lot of like huge coral structure that could have given more identity to your environment and more like, um, you know, another worldly feeling basically. For now, it feels a bit like it's under uh, underdeveloped and it could be like improved quite a lot. So, so I suggest that you like think about the, how to push the environment a bit further to sell the, 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 the purpose of the world. Your game is slow moving. And so you have, we have uh, plenty of time to look at the environment and it needs to support that, I think. But congratulations again. And um, I, I hope you will push it a bit further. Thank you for your feedback. And as you probably know, yes, it's not a lack of intention as we already uh, drew some concept art and we are a lot of other intentions about our environment, but it's mostly cause of a lack of time. But uh, in the full game, if we have like 10 months, we are going to be able to do what we really want. And yes, we regret it too in the art uh, part of the game, but we are quite happy of what we were able to show uh, after all. Thank you. Um, hello, so I'm Sebastian working at uh, Motion Twin. Uh, so great work, great project. So thank you first. 
Um, I had a question regarding the level design of the game. Uh, so the gyre is really quick, you are very slow, and uh, there is little room for uh, experimentation, exploration. Uh, it seems that you need to know uh, what to do and where to go directly in order not to die. So I was asking uh, what was your philosophy regarding this? Uh, do you plan on doing something a little bit like uh, a die and retry? Do you want to do a looping level design like you have shown? Or something a little bit more uh, linear, for example? Uh, I don't know where is the person who's talking to me. Okay, I see you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, I construct my level design uh, following the user journey and translate it as a space. And uh, we also have uh, this uh, accessibility um, button because we have a lot of micromanagement in our game and uh, to, to think about our pilgrim, our building, and where we are going to. So we, this, uh, there is this pass button that uh, lets the time to the player to, uh, okay, where am I supposed to go? You can see the entire map with um, the control also, the entire de de and um, you always um, have the possibility to send your pilgrims uh, in front of your creator to explore and to know, okay, where I'm supposed to go, where, uh, where are the resources, where I need to, to, to yeah, you have to go uh, forward to prepare your journey. Thank you. Hello, I'm Milan. I'm doing marketing and communication for indie games. Uh, first of all, I, it's not really a question; it's more a remark. You put, like, you present your game as RTS, and I didn't see a lot of strategy actually. You focus more on resource management, so this is a like I, I have to play to to check or what strategy you have in the game. And the other point is like on the marketing side, you made a kind of graphics with like the strength. If you can go back to this. Because like I see your, yeah, your game is high in all the aspects. And like you have weakness, like obviously all indie games have some weaknesses and you don't really talk about it. And I think this is important to show what is your game but what your game is not so do you can you like tell me a little bit about this well actually that's my mistake uh, i didn't want to show two more weaknesses and uh, focus more on our strong uh, point uh, because uh, i i think it's a better way to uh, try to sell uh, our uh, well our game for a publisher but uh, well i actually uh, yeah i I could have uh, spotlighted some weak points. You're right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think one of our main weaknesses right now is that we may lack depth, uh, especially in a longer game than the vertical slice. And <laughs> we had a lot of uh, exchanges with uh, Ace, our system designer, who wanted something more complex, and uh, others who wanted something more uh, simple and um, accessible. And so we've tried to find a balance here, but I don't think we have quite uh, managed for the moment, uh, because it's quite hard. Uh, but that will be uh, something we have to work on uh, during a longer production. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Morgan, producer at uh, Guerrilla Games Amsterdam. So once again, like everyone said, that was amazing, really beautiful. Congratulations on that presentation. Um, I first wanted to bounce back on what Alex said. I also think that the environment could use more depth. Like, I want to know more. I want to see things. I want to know what the gyre come from. I want to know more about your world. And I think this is something your environment could support. Uh, I loved how the sound design is incorporated as a gameplay mechanic. Your sound designer must have tons of fun. That's really cool. Finally, my question is about the rhythm. So you, s you are setting this as a casual game. However, I feel like it's constantly, you're constantly on the move as a player. That's like your core mechanic. I would feel 
exhausted if I had to play two to four hours of being constantly on the move. So have you thought about options for your player to actually rest? For once, I would love to see more about the life on the creature, maybe have time slowing down a bit and just see your pilgrims living together and talking together, because I think like that's really, really cool what you made the village on the creature to maybe have a break from the constant movement. Um, okay, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, about this, uh, this is something we didn't show that much, but we have a pause button, uh, which is which uh, works as a strategical, tactical uh, pause, like in a games like FTL, stuff like that. And at any time, you can pause the game, uh, take the time to read stuff, uh, look at the environment, look at what the building do, 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 do yeah. And uh, yeah, you can press on this button at any time, and uh, and, it, and it helps to take the, the time uh, and do the game at your own pace, as you can uh, still uh, make actions, and when you stop the pause, it will, uh, it will do the actions. Hello, uh, I'm Aida Del Sola, um, um, art and uh, creative director. Um, congratulations, I think you did a big, big advancement on your project and, um, and it looks uh, fantastic, but I think it can be better, really. <laughs> it, it can be better because you deserve it. So uh, my comment is about, about uh, dramaturgy. You explain that you have to set the scene, the s to set situations so we can get involved. So um, in, in our description, we, we follow you, but we don't feel involved in this. I think that this idea of community and the prayers is fantastic, but we are following um, explanations and we have to get in. So uh, this is the way you, you say you present it, but um, the, the presentation what uh, which will rest and you will share to everybody is the slideshow. I suggest uh, to prioritize because this is also the main, let's say, problem now is that you don't didn't set priorities uh, visually and uh, in uh, in, the, in the game way. You just uh, um, describe the whole universe. So I think next step can be to to focus more into the, uh, the, um, the challenge and the, dramatur the dramaturgy. And we see it also visually in the, in the slides. There is uh, the background and the foreground are the same level, importance level. So uh, really, if you, um, I, I propose my help to help you, uh, help you to prioritize this and make a slideshow much more compelling. So we can uh, we can talk about this, or you can say it to me, and I can make comments about that. So it can be better. You have the whole thing. You have to make a choice now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Uyghur, for this. Hi, it's uh, Stefan, the Godfather. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I just want a, a few say a few words. Uh, probably, I hope I will do it with every presentation. The change between the last presentation and this one is awful. It's extraordinary what you have done in one month. So I want to congratulate you. Uh, and for remarks, I would say I would agree with all the remarks that was said at the end, uh, all the suggestion. And if you, if you want to try to go further with your game, record all this thing and take them into account. But congratulations. Thank you, Olet. Thank you, Stefan. There's two more questions and then we're gonna stop. Um, hello, it's uh, Cesar from uh, Asobo. Um, very good presentation. Um, the game uh, evolved quite a bit since last time, so it's nice to see. Uh, so the question is, let's say I'm a narrative game lover and I see a game. I don't really see why I would play this game for narrative. So could you elaborate on that quickly? Yes. Uh, so 
since uh, there are quite heavy um, uh, strategy mechanics, we tried uh, not to um, you know, overload it with narrative content and uh, make it quite uh, uh, discreet, uh, but present, uh, mostly through the players and uh, a, a system that we have worked on quite a lot, but uh, may improve uh, the, the barks, the words pronounced by the characters as we control them and as they live their life. Uh, the, the association of the two uh, can uh, uh, really add something and there is a law that we discover piece by piece and mostly something that doesn't appear in the vertical slice but will be in the full game is uh, we discover different tribes and we help them um, uh, re recover and they, uh, we learn prayers from them and we recollect the pieces of uh, this cultural puzzle. Uh, so discovering uh, this and participating in the rediscovery of uh, this narrative puzzle uh, could be interesting. And also uh, the, the something we wanted to develop uh, but didn't have time for the cold slice was altars. Uh, each creature would have a place, a special place, uh, like a, a shrine. Uh, you know, and uh, they would have different uh, characteristics uh, visually. Uh, and so with the creatures returning to their altars, the, the environment will change uh, uh, time after time during the game. That is something that we couldn't develop in a short vertical slice, uh, but I think it will be compelling in a, in a longer game. Hi, uh, Pierre Jean, audio director from Ankama. Uh, good job, um, a lot of work. Um, I've got a few remarks about uh, the audio part. Um, there's a lot of music, a lot of music, <laughs> so it could be very annoying, I think, if you play a long time. Um, I think less music and more ambiance or SD uh, could be a, a great way, a good idea. So I've got two questions. Uh, why do you choose a tonal and a repetitive system music? Okay. And the second one is why do you choose to have always music? Okay, so the, um, what we showcased in the trailer and during the presentation in the, and in the final gameplay video was only a, a short amount of the musical system we built with Pierre-Emmanuel because that was one of my main concerns since it's a game which is supposed to be uh, long sessions, slow paced, strategy, hard thinking, so the music shouldn't take that much space. We tried to make a version of a system we could showcase which would show the prayers, but the full system would actually have two more elements which would be crucial for that rhythm and headspace, which are um, time, time stamps, let's say, after, uh, when you change a prayer, there's a full orchestral version with the full choir, full instruments, but after a short amount of time, it starts decaying into the same music, but a softer, somewhat some softer version with less instruments. Uh, and for the repetitive tonal parts, we actually intended to have the chord progression and the rhythmic structure depend on what biome we're in, but since we only have one biome in the vertical slice, we have the same <laughs> chord progression. Uh, I, I hope these two elements would allow us to breathe a little more in the sound environment. And uh, yeah, I hope it answers your, your question. This was the final questions. So thank you once again to the team. Congrats them for this uh, great work done in four months. And let's welcome the next team, the link. Uh, in the meantime, so as uh, usual, uh, our uh, colleagues from uh, UTAD Madrid thought of you and I have things to give you. So I will give you then uh, while the other team is, uh, is settle settling.
So just for the people who may be curious, the UTAD uh, colleagues prepared an extra life for the, the students, so to help them recover for these four months of projects. Have you ever looked ahead and wondered who will shape the world of tomorrow? Have you ever asked yourselves what kind of world will be built for our children? For those who don't know us yet, we are PROTECT, leaders in scientific innovation and technological development. The creation of a company by our founding father, Mr. Thomas, the first success of our space expedition, our first step on planet VD so far away, Everything led us to our greatest discovery since nuclear fusion, Vinforium. And it is hand in hand with the European Union Army that us, PROTECT, are working assiduously on Vili to extract and refine Inforium. All of that to bring you the last generation of synthetics humanoids. Whatever happens, whatever could the obstacles encountered be, neither the scientific right thinking nor our archaic human ethic will forbid us to be the architects of tomorrow's world. And yet, you might sometimes hear a dark story about the tragical events of the year 2233 in Vili Mining's faci facility. And we can assure you that absolutely nothing happened and everything was perfectly under control. So, as you may have guessed during the trailer, the link is a first-person stealth oral experience in solo on PC, and the whole game, if produced, is supposed to be between four and five hours of gameplay. So about the player target. We have a player base which will be adult and mature in search of a unique oral experience, of course, emphasized on scenarization, sorry, in pursuit of an immersive journey of a few hours in the legacy of Alien Isolation or Outlast. So now let's talk about the overall game experience. The whole setup will take place in a science fiction universe, in a scientific complex, and the player will have to avoid a Napex predator while trying to complete a mission given by the corporation Protect. For the conception of this game, we are putting the emphasis on several intentions which chart the vulnerability and loneliness feeling, choices and sacrifice-oriented mechanics uh, terrific and dreadful environments. And these uh, intentions are supported by our design pillar, which are the building of a distinctive identity in the horror genre with verticality, sacrifice, scenery making. Offering a real deepness in this scenery making and writing supported by audio and visual design. 
and propose a soundness in the whole Koreans and its global realism. So now let us introduce you to the world of the link. The story of the game takes place within its Inforium extraction and experimentation facility, Protect Vili, in the depth of the planet. This place is populated by both human and synthetic workers, although the latter are not treated equally with the former. They are generally assigned to more dangerous tasks and cannot access all the floors of the complex. Protect Vili is at the crossroads between underground galleries with the presence of villain rocks. A more classical SF structure combining large living spaces and narrow technical rooms and finally, horrific laboratories such as barbaric operating rooms. Our environment are then a way to tell the story as much by the layout as by the level art. We will then find the presence of written and audio logs to understand what is happening or what has happened. And the one who will discover all of that is her. There's too much darkness. It's not safe. This model is named SH1 for Human Synthetics Number One because she's the first success of the third generation. She's therefore the result of the hybridization between Inforium and the human. But even if the properties of this substance allow her to have abilities beyond humanity, Ololink is actually quite harmful to her body, so her kind requires the creation of filters. And then in the game, she will have to face a creature that broke into the facility. This is a creature. First of all, you should know that this is not an adult at all. No, eight years ago, an adult version, more, much more larger, and fortunately for Protect, already dead, was discovered, studied, and its immune system was reproduced to create the filters. This species is endangered because it needs Inforium and Inforium has been over-exploited by Protect. And when it broke into the facility, all the Inforium was, were already sealed. However, SH1 is composed of Inforium, so the creature will hunt her. Unfortunately, the environment is not easy for this blind and photosensitive creature. Used to another atmosphere, it will, it will gradually become enraged, using echolocation to track down its prey and kill them thanks to its impressive body, composed of eight legs and a powerful jaw. So, both SH1 and the creature are rigged and animated by our artist, and this is some example of those animations. Our characters, objectives, and motivations will change along with the evolution of the story and the game mechanic. So now let us briefly introduce you to the storyline divided into four acts. The game starts with a prologue, emotionally intense, as you can see on this curve, to set the tone of what the player will experience later. Then come Act 1, in which we discover a character right after the creature broke into the complex. She has to secure the four Emporium pumps to enter production. However, the complex is already damaged and in darkness, so the player will have to find their way to their objective. So the main point of stealth in the link is the sound. So unlike more classic stealth, it's not a matter of line of view, but about how many noise do you make and at which range. So if you make too much sound, the creature can go alert, and if you continue, it can pinpoint your location and kill you. So here, you can see that I made a, a bit of sound and she's alert now of my position, but if I stop actually walking, she will go around again. You will see that in the final video. So also, scattered all around the complex, flares and flashbangs are security assets which Anya can find and use on the spot. So they light up the environment and temporarily repel the creature away, which goes lurking elsewhere. So the second tool is the Hololink, which is one of the most powerful tools Anya has. This is a powerful augmented reality system integrated with an assistant AI. 
So it can be toggled on and off uh, at the player's will by simply pressing a button. And here you can see in close up the complete UI. There's too much darkness. It's not safe. So you can see outlines of objects, line of drawing, and also the sounds you make when walking on the ground and the sound of objects. So the whole link will obviously be a great help to Anya in her mission. So a feature which is not in the vertical slice but will be produced in the full game is the ability of the whole link to display the echolocation waves emitted by the creator when trying to track down the player. As such, the whole link is able to spot danger zone or safe zone like you can see here behind the crates, for example. At the end of this act, when securing the last tank, SH1 will see distinctly the creature and for the first time. Now in Act 2, SH1 will understand the interests of the creature towards the Inforium and the link between them because, as you know, she is made of Inforium. So now that the production is assured, SH1 will be sent to the floor dedicated to the storage of synthetics in order to be evacuated. However, the creature, the creature is going wild and is hunting down a such synthetic. So in Act 2, we increase the overall tension by challenging the player experience he had just gained on Act 1 with another AI and more creature presence, which will help building tension. At the end of this act, trying to escape from the creature, a section of the area collapses, preventing her from evacuating. The communication system is damaged, and she loses contact with the rest of Protect. In Act 3, unable to reach her goal, SH1 rushes into the area that appears before her, the Research and Innovation District, forbidden to all synthetics. We designed our vertical slice from this act. Without any external help, she has to explore blindly this unauthorized floor. She finds out that there is an emergency exit created in order to evacuate Protect. For a reason she doesn't know, well, yet. She witnesses gory scenes like dead bodies on operating tables or in forum pods containing what appear to be fetuses. So, because Inforium is generally not fit to be replacing blood, a system of toxicity filtering is inside Anya's body. So, if three filters are not maintained at the same time, toxicity starts to accumulate. But how is she gonna lose this filter? Well, when facing a near-death situation, or when the player expects the creature to be lurking in a certain spot, um, Anya can choose to interfere with a system to detach a, fuel, a filter full of substance so in forum and throw it to attract the creator from whatever it is on the level. And this comes at a cost, a sacrifice. Each filter missing will impact the toxicity dynamic and as such, Anya's health on the long run. So toxicity is basically a reverse health bar if you want to, to, <laughs> to imagine like it like that. So the less filters you have, the faster the toxicity is gonna build up. And once it reach 100%, it's death. So here you can see how it attracts the creature. So, not that if you reuse the Hololink, the toxicity prediction goes even faster than normal. So, it's often a risk versus reward mechanic of using the Hololink to help you. So, the consequences of having toxicity in your body are kind of dire. Uh, here, you can see like some contrast effect of the toxicity on the left. Uh, and you have the list of the effects. And nevertheless, Anya can still recover some filters during the game, either by picking them or activating a filter dispenser you can see here. And in level design, managing the scarcity of this resource will also be a key factor in raising tension and difficulty. So this end of this act is blended into the following, in which Anya becomes aware of a condition as a human experience. And this is a real shock. With only a filter left and for good, this very short act changed the character's objectives and motivations. Condemned, she will have to make a final sacrifice, destroy Protect this time. So, must she go back down to the earth of the complex to trigger its destruction, but killing the creature and herself in order to stop, at least temporarily, the actions of the corporation? Or 
Should she try to escape in an emergency evacuation shuttle to warn the Earth about what's going on and put an end to protect action for good? Well, if she survives until then. So, well, now that the Act 3 has let, look th uh, let the player experience all the mechanics at their full potential, Act 4 is holding player's breath, player's breath as a final twist uh, in terms of plot, but also mechanics. Uh, so after a practically violent encounter with the creator, uh, the whole link is broken and is con constantly activating, uh, thus putting a load on the toxicity, like I said before. So you are basically forced to use it constantly. And so a Democles effect starts taking place because the Hololink is constantly building toxicity inside you. And so it's also a false helper because it's glitched now. Uh, and so it starts uh, showing you some false informations which will be build uh, helplessness uh, and increasing fear of the player. So the um, seek for realism and tension growth that we pursue is also transmitted through the soundscape of the game. Most of sounds from the game are aiming for a natural aesthetic in order to immerse the player in a world that could be his or her. And the uh, others are more evocative and abstract, and they are used to dramatize the key narrative elements and arouse the player's fear. The realism can be heard, for example, in the breath fluctuations of SH1, allowing in a diegetic manner to provide a feedback about her health status and to create tension in the player as it indicates that the character is near the creature and or not be far from death. The system is based on the distance between the character and the creature. Then, if the creature is not there, on the level of fatigue and the move speed of her character. And in the following example, you'll hear different breath from LT to an LC, and then from a near enemy to no enemy around. So the dramatization for its part is linked to the level of tension in the character's mind. The evolution of the character psyche is materialized by the growing tension and the ominous feel that we can hear in the ambience. At the height of this tension, the character may hear sounds that seems to come from the creature when those are only part of his psyche. This creates a sense of confusion for the player who is never really sure of what he's hearing. And finally, the change of perspective is used along the game to make the player feel different sensations during progression. The best example is switching from a noisy environment to something very quiet. And you see, as there is no sound anymore in the room, you are all wondering what's going to happen. And we hope the effect will be the same in the game. But examples are better than explanation, and this is now the time to see the game's walkthrough. Shit! I couldn't. Everything is destroyed. How am I going to get out of the complex now? Mr. Klein, this is SH-1. I couldn't evacuate the complex. The synthetic storage level has been totally wrecked by this... thing. Why is it coming after us so much? I'm currently in the hallway leading to the Research and Innovation District. Do you have any information on this level that might be useful to help me get up there? It does not figure in my database. Mr. Klein, do you copy? Professor? The communication network must have been destroyed too. I'll have to find a way out by myself and find a replacement filter before the Emporium becomes toxic to my body. There's too much darkness. It's not safe.
I don't think that matters anymore, right? I should be able to replace a third filter to hold the toxicity, or lure the creature with my Emporium if I run into it again. Is there really an emergency evacuation for humans? Why would they need it here?
What have they done? Fuck. This is Dr. Ritter from the Inforium Science Department. This procedure should always be followed to insert Inforium into a human body. The replacement of blood by it can only be done at the embryonic stage, during implantation, to be precise. The subject of the operation must be the genitor of the future hybrid. The subject must therefore be adult, female, and three weeks pregnant. Keep the subject awake. However, the administration of sedatives is allowed. Tie up the subject to avoid sudden movements. And very important, the enforium must be maintained at a temperature equal to the subject's body temperature. So you saw our reticle slice in Act 3, and all three men's intentions were grab the attention of the player, offer them a condensed game experience, and leave them wanting more. This is the layout of the vertical slice. We wanted to explore two types of atmosphere, the fear, by the presence of a creature in an environment that is supposed to be familiar. It's the orange part. And the other atmosphere is the disgust. Disgust this time by our own environment, by protect, and it's the green part. When it comes to the shape of the level, we chose a strong contrast. Large spaces, more reassuring, easier to escape, and which drive the player's attention upwards. And very narrow spaces, more difficult to increase discomfort and to increase fear. Implementing accessibility in the development process was one of our priority, as you could see during this presentation. The main goal was to provide control remapping, subtitles and captions, and allow visual and audio settings for a more comfortable experience for a larger public. User research can help defining tools, as you know, to achieve the design intentions of fear for specific events. Here you can see a graphic representation of the levels of fear intended in pink and observed in playtest in blue depending on game events. The important here is to see that predicted tendencies are respected and it was possible by looking for fear factors and reducers in other horror video games and in literature in general. By using the fear factors we could increase fear with these types of events such as entering a new location and anticipating a jump scare, such as entering in the second part of the vertical slice, for example, and of course being located by the creature and escaping it. But we could also inject a relief feeling by using exploration phases and safe zones, such as exploring the meeting room, for example, and cinematic moments, such as the end of the game. It's interesting to know that if we succeed applying this method, we can implement it to the whole experience and use physiological measurements in playtest to achieve more precise results. And now for Beyond the Link. Um, for our vertical slice, we produce it with an open space of 12 students using tools at our disposal, like Discord, Jira, and SharePoint. 
But for the full production hypothesis, for this exercise, we chose to be a small AA studio looking for an editor to help finance the project and marketing and communication advice. We are looking at several studios like Nacon and Focus, uh, Focus Home Interactive, which are double AA um, specialist studios. For the target player, we are targeting the horror game niche segment in a priority to our target is defined by thrill-seeking players, player looking for an engaging yet scary story, and science fiction aficionados. We are also looking toward Twitch and YouTuber streamers, content creators for our game is very streamable content. So by extension, we aim to target horror game viewers. We did the benchmark in our segment and competitors on the AAA and AAA <laughs> market. Um, in our quadrant, our competitors are all game limited replayability due to story driven content. Once a player finishes the story, they more likely won't replay and want to play another one. We offer a game that can attract those players with our original stories and we can make ourselves a place in the segment. We also have an eye for future competitors in the horror game science fiction genre. Here you can see our references, both from video game and movies. This is our global production estimate roadmap for the 24 months production, taking into account already made assets and advances. You can see we are starting with the Act 3, as a lot of assets and concepts are already in the vertical slice already. To go further in the production, here's a production pipeline detailing the production on one act of the game. To produce the game, we are using acts as units. We are following a production pipeline to produce and test each act one, one after the other. E each of the four acts that up to four months to produce, act three is the exception and costs from $270 uh, to uh, euro, sorry, to 430 euros as the size varies. Uh, we estimated the man months and staffing evolution throughout the project to help us estimate the sizing and budget needed for the full project. We chose the price according to competitors and as a double A game, we wanted to pass the 30 euros in the game limit. We also looked at our competitors for the sale estimation and the horror game average is 1 million. We took a lower estimation considering our new IP and new studios. We have an estimated budget of 1.78 million and we estimate a 200K copy sold and a break-even point at 100K copy sold. We are also setting digitally in the digital setting as we are still a new IP. For the communication plan, we wanted to showcase our game and game convention and launch at the end of October. We have a potential prequel DLC if the, well, if the game works well. I hope you liked our presentation. I want to present to you briefly the team. For our user researcher, we have Lea that is here. For our game designers, we have Maylis and Baptiste, Maylis and Baptiste Key. Uh, for our programmers, we have Julien, Benoit, and Baptiste also. For our audio designer, we have Enzo, that is right there. Uh, our project manager is Axel, which is speaking last. And for the 3D artists, we have Gael, Leticia here, and myself. And of course, we want to thank the voice actors that worked with us. Uh, for SH1, we have Eleanor Griffith, and for uh, Dr. Isaac Ritter, we have Tim Pluman. Thank you very much, and we're waiting for your question now. <laughs> it's a shame. I didn't have her in my list. We have Clara as our UI designer right there that worked with us for four months. I'm sorry, Clara. So thank you. Who wants to start first? Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Pierre. I work at uh, Bank Island, and I have a question regarding accessibility. Given that um, uh, the monster is mostly queued through audio cues, uh, how would you go about making the game accessible to um, to uh, deaf? Wait, yeah, deaf people. Yes, I get it. Um, with captions, we, we thought that captions will be the better um, the, the, the better way to 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 make these sounds appear for of deaf or rented people. I mean. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. 
Hello. Um, Alex, uh, lead at Ubisoft Bordeaux. Um, holy moly. <laughs> uh, that was incredible. Like, congratulations to you all. Really. Uh, I'm so impressed by what I just saw. Really, really impressed. So, and from all the specialty uh, involved in the project, um, but especially on the artists, you guys rock. Uh, like, it's not, everything is not perfect, all right? But there is so much potential. Everything is very coherent. It's beautiful. Uh, there is some tech issue here and there, but it's all right. It's a student game. I mean, it doesn't look like it, but it is. Uh, like congratulations, I, I I don't have any more remarks, but really well done, guys. Quickly, thank you, Alex, for your remark. You've been there for all three presentations before, so it's nice to have this kind of feedback now. Thank you very much. Um, well, hi. Jaime from Utah. Uh, first of all, so I want to congratulate you because the, uh, the transition of the first idea that you have, then that you present, <coughs> then to the second one, and then you have also rescued a few things from the first presentation, and you have polished them, and you have made them work. You have made your game work, and that was amazing. And so, in that sense, also I want to congratulate you. And just a little bit, a little tip for uh, the presentation: as you are all well uniform, and also that that was nice. I have to say, it could have been also great, just as you have said that nothing happened on 2053. Maybe we could be like, uh, I don't know, your uh, in investors, and you can tell us the secret about it, just to theme a little bit more the presentation. Um, also, I would like to know how, please, uh, the checkpoints, how do they work, please? And at the same time, there is a moment where you can take different, uh, well, the, the filters. Is that a limited? So you can take every filter that you want? And also the uh, the uh, logs, the audio logs, doesn't alert the beast because they are also sound. And um, well, again, congratulations! But I just has those those remarks on the tip. Thank you for the for the the, the feedback. Like it's it's great. Uh, and and for about the question. Um, uh, so about the the checkpoints, uh, the answer is simple. It does not work. <laughs> it's actually uh, like a video, like we, we took two run and we made a respawn, but it's not like that, like actually in the vertical slice, when you die, you die, <laughs> and you have to reset the game, no, but not the game, but the, you have to come back to the menu and play again, uh, but yeah, in, in the, it's linked with to the, your question with uh, filter dispenser, and the checkpoints in the full game will be located in safe area or small area like you can fall for example with uh, in Resident Evil um, with the little writing machine it's safe zones um, uh, and basically you will have these dispensers here uh, and yeah in safe zones they are uh, only like unlimited and you can basically like come back of your uh, in your toxicity uh, value uh, and outside of safe zones there will be just lone filters like I said, uh, so it's uh, we and we will play on the scarcity of the resources. That's uh, if that answered uh, your question. And so about the log sound, there was a, uh, a debate about that indeed. Uh, like actually, uh, in the full game, it would attract the creator, uh, but here uh, it's like the creature is continuing its path because it's he, she, she is actually um, going to the last room, which has a lot of inforium, and she's way more attracted by inforium, like it's the, the first choice in her, um, in her decision, um, rather than just uh, tracking some prey. Yes, uh, hello, Aida, it's Solar. Uh, congratulations, it's amazing. 
amazing, super immersive, um, very... Um, uh, you, you d did a whole thing. You are in uniform. Uh, we enter. Uh, we are immersed immediately. Just uh, one remark: when uh, uh, just go farther into your volcano opening, when we see the monsters in the in the trailer, beginning of the trailer, we see the monsters far away. You are talking about horror. We talk already about horror and terror. Uh, you have a, um, you can edit the, the monster just uh, being his, uh, his face with us, you know, just a volcano opening because he's far and we have to feel horror. The horror, we feel it in the, in the vertical slice. What is fantastic is um, we go from terror that we can still act to horror where either we make in our pants, <laughs> either we find a scapegoat and you, uh, you did it. So we have the scapegoat. We have this paralysis of horror that is fainting, peeing, <laughs> or, or dying, or trying a last chance. You did it. So congratulations. Just be careful of your uh, volcano opening because you can do it better with a very a scary, um, horrifying um, creator at the end and not in the bottom of the corridor, okay? Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Uh, about the trailer, the point was not to make you feel what you will feel in the game, because it's both a trailer and some kind of advertisement. Um, we want you to come in the game and feel the game and see how you die, for instance, when you have the creature on your face. but. Um, on many trailers, we did a huge benchmark on, on trailers and pre-gameplay trailers on next game and previous games. And uh, most of the time, you can guess what will happen. And you're both um, a bit scared about it, but you want to be scared more. And the trailer doesn't give you that. And that is what is interesting. You want to buy the game, you want to play the game, and you want to be scared properly instead of just watching the trailer. And it, it happens a lot, so we choose to do that, especially on the trailer. Um. Hi, uh, Eliza from Ubisoft uh, Paris. Um, thank you for the presentation, it was very interesting. Your creature gave me the creeps. Uh, uh, anyway, I have one remark and one question. Um, the thing that it's kind of uh, weird right now is the uh, some specializations, and it's it's kind of it's kind of a shame because it's very difficult to understand where the creature is right now and probably uh, choose to take a path uh, instead of another. So it was kind of a weird uh, feelings, and my question were uh, on the user research side. Uh, what were your KPI to measure uh, players' fears? Thank you. Uh, I was uh, based on a scale of levels of fear uh, that I found in literature. Uh, the scale uh, goes from 1 to 10. Uh, 1 is calm and 10 is panic. Uh, and it describes uh, what we can see on the player's side and on the game side. What was great that was that for the game side, uh, game designers could use this to say, like, we want a level two, so in the game we will have that. And then with the player's side, I could see during a uh, playtest if uh, it was the right level or not. And in these descriptions, uh, there were like uh, some feelings or uh, observations on about the players um, uh, about the player, and uh, to have this uh, data, I used self uh, self confrontation. So uh, after the session of the game, uh, we just watched together uh, the game session, and I was asking questions like. Uh, how do you feel there? Um, what was your feeling in that part or in that part? What, what would you want to do? And then I could like do this uh, graphic rep representation by uh, saying, okay, it was this level, this level, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Thierry Dilger, freelance sound designer. I have a question. I'm here. A uh, question about the production of sound uh, for the full uh, for the full game, and uh, I just want to know how much people do you need for the full game for the sound department, and how much will it will it cost? I think we would need um, between two and three sound designer and one composer full time, like uh, maybe one person for the. Um, for the, um, the pre-production phase, and then uh, two to three people. Cost of it, because you have budgeted the whole cost of the, of the game, so how much from this cost is for sound and music? Would be an average of 10%. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I have to go to the next question. Hello, Milan, marketing communication for indie games. Uh, why did you choose to have the main character talking to herself? Uh, actually, uh, she does not always talk to herself. Uh, we chose to present the last part of the game, it's Act 3, and we wanted for the full game to have an evolution of how um, SH1 um, behaves. So since she's, she thought she was a synthetic for the first part of the game, she's more quiet, um, not much talkative, but when she evolves, she gains in humanity, so she talks more and she she ha she feels fierce too, so uh, talking is for uh, like comfort herself, and uh, for this uh, for the vertical slice, it was also a way to teach the player to her uh, abilities like the filters, like uh, how she can gain one, use another, and uh, also for darkness, since it, when it's dark, the creature can be there. So uh, it was to teach the player that they can uh, grab uh, flares to light corridors. Uh, at last? <laughs> oh, one after. Okay. So just I want to say that uh, the progression since the last presentation is great. You wanted to make to give the sensation of of uh, I don't know which, uh, both ter terror and horror and fear, and you created some, this feeling, we see it, we feel it now. Uh, you say you are more, s you m create m more fear than in other fear games. It has to be demonstrated, but I want to say that it w it's a really a, a demonstration what you wanted to, to show. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great. Ah, okay. Uh, just to add, uh, it was not uh, more fear than in other video games, but uh, if you see the um, <laughs> the graphic representation, it was less than our intentions. But oh, no, no, c'était pas ça, mais c'est pas grave. Thank you, Stéphane. <laughs> Um, hello, C César from Asobo again. Um, so uh, one thing is uh, the sound, like uh, someone said, uh, when you when she speaks to herself, like it seems kind of strange since she's been hunted by a, a creature that's uh, only attracted by sound mostly. So that's strange. But the the the, the second thing is um, when she breathes, uh, does the creature hear it? Because otherwise. As soon as the creature gets close, she keeps, she starts breathing loudly, and then the creature gets attracted to it more. So it feels like the player should be able to cover a mouse or something. And is it something that's planned? Is it something that you want to do? Play with this? 
Yeah, there, there would be something to do with that. Like for, um, in the vertical slice, it's not the case. The, the briefing system, it's not uh, some of the sound that attract the creature. But uh, if we would have more time to do an equi equilibration of everything, like we would surely do it, I think. All right, okay. That would be interesting because I think it can be frustrating if you make sound when you don't want to because your character is scared and not you. So right, anyway, great job and great presentation. Came a long way since last time, so great job. Uh, I just wanted to add something. Uh, when the character is talking to herself, it's only on during safe zones. When the creature is there, she she's not talking anymore to not attract the creature. But it was it's difficult to see it because as a player we don't know when it's a safe zone and when in it's not a safe zone. But uh, during the previous act. She try. She she succeeds in uh, escaping the creature, and now she is safe. And uh, it's when she uh, used the computer and the lights uh, turns turn off that the creature enters again. But before that, she was safe. Thank you. That was that l the last uh, question. So uh, let's congratulate the team once again. As a reminder, it was made in four months. Uh, so, and let's welcome the, for the third team of this morning, Along the Rift. <laughs> yes, please come back. I have things for you. Hey, I was wondering, did you ever have that feeling as a kid of being torn all the time? Especially when your parents are arguing. Like, you know, you are in the middle of a conflict and you know you can take a stand to resolve it or to tone it down. Because if you don't do anything, they might argue more or even divorce. But you know, you're still a kid, it's not your business. So instead, you escape the situation. You just go in your room, play some music, and stay in your own comfy, childish environment. 
But wait, not too childish because you're 10 now and you're not a baby anymore. You remember that all of your friends' parents are divorcing. This is really common, they say. And you decide to save their relationship and keep the family together. Those are the conflicting feelings that we wanted to highlight in Along the Rift. And this is what Maya, our main character, is feeling in the game. Wow. Dad, I'm here. Maya, for God's sakes, where were you? Do you see that place? This is amazing. It's straight out of Jurassic Park. Where are you going? There has to be a way out. I'm just trying to figure it out, but your anxiety isn't helping right now. Maya, do you see a place where you can reach us? Somewhere you can climb? Come on, Aaron. Wait a bit until she comes back to herself. Are you all right, sweetheart? What happened? Did I, did I fall? Maya and her parents are hiking in the mountains when suddenly she falls into a deep rift. She is now alone trying to find a way out with the distant help of her parents. You embody this 10-year-old kid and your journey begins. So Along the Rift is a narrative adventure game which lasts three hours made for PC and consoles. It's an immersive and introspective story one that will portray a coming of age through the eyes of a young girl. And we want that game experience as accessible as possible to allow a wide audience to plunge into complex family bonds through this metaphor of a little girl falling into a rift. For their summer vacation, yeah, okay. For their summer vacation, Maya and her dad, Nathan and Aaron, had to go to France in the Alps. Aaron is not very enthusiastic about being here, and he's always complaining. This great little discord between the couple and Maya is getting tired of it. Along the rift takes place when the family is hiking, having a good time, until one more disagreement begins between Aaron and Nathan. And this is the moment Maya will fall in the rift. So Maya is 10 years old. She was adopted at the age of two by Aaron and Nathan. She is very close to them and wants to make them proud. The thing is, like all couple, they sometimes argue. And Maya is very empathetic, so when it's happened, she tries to calm it down, to protect all her family. The rift is a way for her to escape reality thanks to her imagination and rebalance things by focusing on herself rather than her parents. It is also a way for her to escape her most frightening fears and deal with her lack of self-confidence. So, here is how Maya looks like in the game. As a player, you will embody her thanks to a first-person view and help her to progress in her journey. So, Maya's journey is divided in three acts, all taking place in the rift. It is completed with an intro and an epilogue, both taking place outside of the rift. These acts showcase the evolution of Maya during her adventure. She starts as a very frightening new girl, always in the need for, for her parents' attention, but she will learn to manage her fear and becoming more and more independent and brave before joining her parents again. So, you just started the game and you discover that Maya has just fallen in the rift. She takes her time to discover it and it's beautiful. Also, a bit worrying. So, how can we help her and how can you, the player, help her, can help her? So. In Along the Rift, you embody Maya with a first-person view. The controls are thought to be minimalistic and easy to learn, 
because for example, if you play with a gamepad, you will only need the two joysticks to play the entire game. The left stick being mainly used for the movements and the right stick for the camera. But of course, the game is also playable with keyboard and mouse. Navigating through the rift is mainly done by walking, which will be paced depending on the mental state of Maya. For example, in stressful situation, Maya will move faster and be out of breath. Also, in some of stressful situations, Maya will have to jump over gaps or obstacles. And as you can see here on the video, the scales of the jump is oversized to emphasize on Maya's spaces perception. And of course, the, the jump is scripted and the player cannot die in the game. And sometimes she will also have to climb. She will also have to climb, and climbing will be a real challenge for her, because it will remind her of her falls in the rift. Maya does get more and more intrigued about the rift by exploring it on her own, but she also has a deep need to maintain a connection with her parents by talking to them. Dialogues are here to define her characters and their relationships. It will also help to understand the emotions of Maya and how she will grow up to become more and more independent. Thanks to our choice system, we can showcase the evolution of Maya's state of mind throughout her journey. There are some light nuances in Maya's answers that her dad will have to take into account. For instance, here's what happens depending on the player's choice. Are you all right, sweetheart? It's okay, Daddy. I guess I'm fine. Don't worry. It's okay. Stay calm. We'll get you out of here. But you gotta stay with us, okay? We can't see a thing from here. So your mission is to find an easy way up, okay? And now, this is what would have happened if you made the other choice. Are you alright, sweetheart? I said I'm fine. Okay, my girl, calm down and take a deep breath. Look around you. Tell us if you can find an easy way to climb up. The subtle changes allow us to give the players more insights on what the character is going through, by displaying all the answers she is considering when talking to her dads. The player's choices ultimately did not have a very deep impact on the game story. Our goal was to give them just enough agency so that they could protect themselves in Maya's mindset. We wanted to ensure a good readability of the dialogues while keeping them as fluid and organic as possible. To answer the parents, you have to use the joystick. Both joysticks can be used. The subtitles are here to reinforce the understanding of the dialogues. You can see here they have a black background and the name of the speakers are displayed with different colors. They are available in French and in English. For Maya's answers, we made the choice to show her emotions through two aspects. The bubble shapes, which represent the conflict three states of Maya's growth. Bubbly angles for the rooting into childhood. Quicklude angles for the entry into adolescence. And square angles for the adulthood overview. And the bubble colors represent the emotion Maya is feeling. Yellow for the joy, purple for the fear, red for the anger, and blue for the maturity. Dialogues bring a lot of narrative elements to the player. In addition, what we call mini-stories are here to give a deeper understanding of Maya's inner mind. The rift is full of dangerous-looking caves, but some others are very calm and reassuring with mini-stories hidden in the environment. Those ones act as quiet and entertaining moments for Maya where she uses her imagination to escape stressful situations. There are moments where you can experience different kinds of gameplay, always using the two joysticks. By choosing some elements, you will create fictional stories built on a, with a classical three-act structures, just like children's tale. Each mini-story highlights a specific feeling Maya is experiencing at the moment, always with the intention to show that Maya is confronting her fears. Here is an example of the first mini-story. It takes place on a rock where we, you embody a small character that Maya drew with a piece of chalk. As you choose to collect different items, you create a little story by choosing the character, the location, and the opponent to defeat. No matter what you choose, the story will still revolve around the same idea. Maya is learning to deal with her fears.
Since our main character is a very young teenager, she is living through a period of changes. The game is a metaphorical view of this transition. Here are some of the concept art we've done at the very beginning of the game. We wanted to focus on Maya's perception of the world and her unique vision of it. The moment Maya is in the rift, the environment start looking uh, distorted and unrealistic. Maya is amplifying the reality through the small quarrels between her parents and the stress that comes along with it. You can see the contrast in here. On the picture on the left, the environments are kind of realistic, but the longer Maya dives into the rift, the more surreal it becomes, as you can see on the right picture. Some areas appear huge or small and claustrophobic or even comforting and magical. All these characteristics are directly linked to her feelings. When Maya is stressed out and far from her parents, she encounters a strange and worrying silhouette. It embodies her fear of the dark, of loneliness, and her fear that her parents might divorce. Here is how the silhouette looks like in the game. Come on, Maya. This thing is... It's all in your head. As you can see, most of the time the silhouette appears on the walls like a distorted shadow. It started being a frightening opponent for Maya. But from the middle of Act 2, Maya turns it into a friendly figure who will help her through her journey. To give the player a deeper overview of Maya's mind, some floating texts that we call talk bubble appear in the environment. These are constituted of small words that Maya is thinking about. Sometimes the talk bubble appears like an echo of her parents' discussion. It also appears to show the player where to go next when they start to gaze around in a rift, like on the left pictures. And it may also guide the player to ministry locations, as you can see on the right picture. Sometimes, like in this video, the talk bubble represents very specific fears blocking for a time the player progression. Now we are going to the game's art direction and address a bit uh, about how it serves our intentions. Our main references being games such as Life in Strange or Firewatch, uh, we strive for a chill and colorful mood through a semi-realistic art direction within a long rift. Therefore, we are relying on the use of volumetric fog as well as strong emphasis on lighting, as seen in the video above as an example. Through the vertical slides, we diversified the colors and mood Maya got through during her deep dive into the rift to illustrate the multiple state of mind she crosses and strengthen the bond between her character and the player. For the props and the environments, we heavily use uh, procedural materials produced to be applied directly in the game's world or on assets uh, as a way to save production time. The semi-realistic art direction means we also use flashy saturated colors and to add a unique, an unique effect within the game, we are using a custom procedural filter that provides a brush stroke and a grunge effect uh, through texturing on every props project for the game uh, as a way to give them a soft, childish appearance. For sound design, we decided to keep uh, several pillars that were very important for us, and one of them was immersion. This goes through the use of binaural mixes, especially of some sounds like ambiences and whether it be beds or ass shots. We are also aiming for a f strong contrast, and this is especially in uh, looking to the graphic direction. We have the phase where Maya is more into her head, and these are more far from reality, whereas the ones she's quite her head up her sleeves is more, it tends to be more realistic with more ambience focused sounds. And we also decided to use sound as story and emotion conveyor a lot, especially via the use of dialogues, of course, but the music also plays a great role in that. From the beginning of the conception, one of our main intentions was to make the game the more accessible possible. And to do that, we established two target audiences for our game. The first one, our core players, which are narrative game lovers, who like to feel immersed in a story, 
and to imagine another reality. And the wider audience with casual players who love games with easy controls and possibly parents who are not necessarily players. So our goal is to make the game accessible not only for people with disabilities but also for the specificities of our target audience. For example, we know that casual players need very easy controls and a tutorial to understand how to move the character. To fill this objective, we will play test with people uh, who are not used to play video games and also with accessibility users and impaired players. We will also have other options, for example, for comfortability and to adaptation to all play styles. The controls will be able to be remapped, as well as subtitles that will be entirely custom customizable, like the size, language and colors. Another last example of accessibility feature we could think about is to have patterns in the dialogue bubbles to distinguish each dialogue choices for colorblind people. The vertical slice we made during these last months is about one eighth of the entire game to improve the originality and the feasibility of our concept. It is located here, starting at the very beginning of the first act of the entire game and ending halfway through it. During this slice, we follow Maya as she falls into the rift and has a discovery of this underground world. It is divided in six very short zones, each of them corresponding to an area on Maya's journey. From the hole she fell into to the igloo where she takes a break while being separated from her family. You can see a representation of Maya's first level to her adventure. When she is in a calmer state, like these two moments, she will be able to take the time to draw and play the mini stories. You can also see at the bottom when the dad will be present and when the silhouette will appear. This is the whole map of the slice as seen from above. You can see the six zones of Maya's journey with a variety of scales and shapes. Now, here it is, as seen from the side, showing you the verticality of some of the areas. And now, we are continuing with our production plans for the entire game, here is a walkthrough that we recorded of the vertical slice. until she gets back to herself. Are you all right, sweetheart? What happened? Did I... did I fall? It's okay. Stay calm. We'll get you out of here. But you gotta stay with us, okay? We can't see a thing from here. So your mission is to find an easy way up, okay? Okay. Promise me you'll both stay here, huh? It's okay, honey. You're all safe. We're not going anywhere. Ugh, it's so dusty here. I'm sure there are plenty of spiders here. They could get into my shoes. Okay, I think she can climb that wall right there. But wait, it, it looks high for her. I'm not sure she can do that. I found it. Well, it's... Hey, are you both looking for me up there? Yes, sweetie, we're looking at you. Take your time, okay? Just be careful. I think we better call for an emergency. We checked. There's no network in these... Ah! <coughs> Maya! Are you okay? This is crazy. It's obvious she can't climb by herself. It's too high. <laughs> we'll find another solution. Try to, try to calm down, Nate, please. Dad, Daddy, I'm sorry. I... I should have been more careful. We're gonna get you out of this, Birdie. There are so many cavities here. There must be a path connecting to this hole. Mike, do you see this little gap right there? Can you go through? Yeah, there's a small passage here, but I'm not sure about it. It's too dark. For God's sakes, Aaron, where are you going? 
Oh, oh, okay. Maya, Dad just went a little further to see where that little path leads. We'll see if there's a way out on the other side so you can get out of here, okay? It's okay. She can go. Okay, sweetie. Take the small path and we'll meet you right ahead. Wait, Daddy! I don't want to be pushy, but it's going to be dark soon, and you know how safe she gets when she's alone. Or... <gasps> are, are you there? Dad! Daddy! Is that you? Dads! I'm coming! We're here! Maya! Look to your left! You didn't answer when I was calling for you. I was afraid you were gone. Calm down, sweetie. Everything's fine. We are staying with you till the end, okay? You just have to follow us, and we'll find a way together. Yes, okay. But I'm tired. And there's always pebbles getting in my shoes. Because honestly, babe, I can't imagine us coming here every vacation. Maya being bored, the village lost in the middle of nowhere, and language barrier. I thought you wanted her to learn French. And believe me, Maya is never bored here. She enjoys the mountains. And she's so into writing this book with me. Eh, uh, seriously. I can't picture myself living here. And come on, Nate, your sister doesn't need you. Oh, my. You want to talk about that again? Dad! Relax. I'm just saying that her condition doesn't seem that bad. We can find solutions so we don't have to come here at the first sign of trouble. But I'm enjoying it here. And I'm happy to see my sister. Anyways, next time, I'll come here alone. So you'll stay in those traffic jams you love so much. Hey, Dad. Daddy, remember that time we went to the Grand Canyon with Aunt Violet, but I had chicken pox? I was just a kid at the time, but I still remember it. It was so itchy. <laughs> yes, I remember that. I used to call you Chippy. Yes, and Daddy was putting so much sunscreen on me all the time, I looked like a snowman in each picture. <sighs> Come on. Let's keep walking. Oh, yeah. She has to go this way. Maya? Maya? No, I... I won't go in there. Dad, I won't go this way. It's too dark. Stay calm, sweetie. It's over soon. There could be snakes in there. I don't want to go. It's too dark. Okay, my girl. Keep cool, please. Wait. Honey, I don't... I don't think it's a good idea. Take my headlamp and fix it on your head. Just take a quick look in this passage and see where it goes. I'm gonna check if I can meet her further ahead. Anyway, I think I need some space to breathe alone. Yeah, just do that. Sorry, sweetheart. I can't believe how pushy your dad can be sometimes. Seriously. <gasps> Daddy, do you hear that? What was it? I, I think there's a monster in there. Well, what are you talking about, honey? No worries. It's just, it must just be your imagination. <laughs> Maya, stay here. I'll be right back. Honey, are you all right? Aaron! But, Daddy, wait! What's going on? Is Dad okay? Where is he? <sighs> I have to join them now. I can do it. just hit his foot a bit, but Maya, I told you to stay back there. We would have come for you, sweetheart. It's okay, babe. Relax. She's here now. 
Are you hurt, Mike? Is everything fine down there? Yeah, all good. It's just a scratch. Oh, that seems okay. You're such a fighter. Do you see that place? This is amazing. It's straight out of Jurassic Park. An astronaut floating in space battles a sinister T Rex in the dark. Hi! Come on, Birdie, where are you? Dad, I'm here. Look at the drawing I've just made. Oh, that's wonderful, honey. Listen, sweetheart, we're pretty sure we saw someone just a bit further away. We're gonna go see if we can ask for some help, okay? Don't go too far. We'll be back in just a second. Hmm, okay. I'll stay here. What is this place? I am Maya, Snow Queen of this mighty kingdom. And you, monster, you will not enter my icy castle. And now that you have seen our vertical slice, let's talk about our production plan for the entire game. So, we produced the vertical slice in four months with six zones and two mini stories in a team of 11 students. And for the whole game, to make the three acts, we will produce 40 zones and around 12 mini games. So, this is what our long term production schedule looks like. So, we will need one more month of pre production. 
then 10 months of production, and finally, three months for the closing. And we plan to ship the game in April 2023, after an important phase of polish and the time needed to port the game to different platforms. And on the staffing side, so here is the core team of the project, which developed the vertical slice and that would continue the adventure. And we will need reinforcements during the production phase, including a tech artist, a character artist, and a third game designer. We will also hire a writer, an animator, and a composer in freelance. So we will be on average 13 people during the development. And this brings us to a total of 152 person months for the remaining 13 months of production. And if we consider that the average cost per person is 4,500, this gives us a production budget of about 650,000 euros. And now let's take a look at our business plan. So here are what we identified as the main selling points of Along the Rift. So first, it's an adventure that plunges you into complex family ties. Secondly, you play as a 10-year-old girl through her vision of the Rift with the materialization of her fears uh, and her thoughts in the environment. And finally, you have to balance the need for independence with the need for parents to find your way out. And through benchmarking, looking at the duration and the price of these competing games, we decided to go for the premium model and to set our launch price at 15.90 euros. And concerning communication, as you can see here, we have already started to create a communication on social networks. And then we are thinking of putting ads on social networks, contacting influencers and Twitchers, and launching a Kickstarter to federate new players around the game. And about sales and distribution, here is a quick overview. So we plan to release Along the Rift on PC in Steam, in Steam and Epic, and on console in Microsoft Store and PlayStation Store. So with an estimated average selling price of eight euros and removing variable costs, this gives us an estimated net income per unit of four euros. And this gives us a break-even point as 340,000 units sold. However, in view of the figures for competing games, we really believe that we can be more ambitious and sell over far 400,000 units. And to reach these sales figures, we need a publisher. So obviously, uh, the best stage taken by the publisher is to be defined in the contract. But if it takes, for example, 30% of the profits, uh, it can win up to almost 1 million according to the sales. So uh, here are our needs and here are the revenues we think we can bring into a publisher. So now we are targeting the following ones. So Xbox Game Studio, Annapurna Interactive, Arte, Plugin Digital. And this was the final presentation of Along the Rift. We hope you enjoyed it and thank you all for your attention. First comments, questions, reactions, yes. Hi, so I'm Cecile from uh, Focus Entertainment, uh, so congrats on this presentation. Like uh, all the team before, before you, uh, it's nice to see how uh, much you have improved, um, especially yeah, in presenting the game and telling, conveying what's your purpose with it. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, what prevents me as a player from just uh, actually obeying, uh, which is to sit there and wait uh, for my parents. Because uh, just um, at some point, uh, I saw the thought bubbles, uh, one that said uh, something like too far, 
and I think as a player, I would take that as a hint uh, that I have to go back. Yeah, so uh, our goal for with this game is that um, at the beginning, uh, Maya is very dependent on her, on her two dads, but uh, as she um, continues her journey, uh, she can uh, become more uh, independent. And for instance, as you can see, uh, at uh, about half of the vertical slice, there's a moment where she just uh, disobeys by just following uh, what she wants to, you know? And uh, after that, there is a time where she can um, uh, have a nice reminder of um, that it's nice to have parents, you know, and that she has to come back at some point. So yeah, um, our goal is to convey that uh, idea uh, with the game, to have a, to find a balance between the dependence on the parents and the independence and the growing up of Maya. It, it, yeah, but I don't think uh, it really answers my question. In as a player, because I am not Maya, I'm just like the the director of Maya's <laughs> adventure. And so if I have uh, stuff in game that tells me, oh, you've gone too far, then I might want to obey the game in a way <laughs> and just go back. So just do, do you have, like, if I go backwards, is there an incentive to send me forward again? Or it's just... Yeah. So if you go backwards, you have some talk bubble that says move on. So you don't have the choice to move on. Like, and you have some lines uh, of Maya telling that she had to go to, to go through the rift. Yeah. Okay, and thank you. In the video, it was a bit rushed because we had uh, to like gain time, you know. But for uh, normal players in playtest, uh, players take the time to discover their environment before going on when they feel like it, you know. Thank you. Um, hi, Jaime from Madrid, you that? Again, it's amazing to see all the progress that you have and how have you listened to everything that we have already said you in previous tribunals, so have you created the different environments using and taking into account the colors and the different sensations that Maya feel. At the same time, I think that there are some questions that now that we have seen the final, the final product we have pop up, like, for example, how is that the parents haven't jumped inside the reef to help her? Because I think that a lot of parents here will agree that they will try to, or that they will go. So maybe that is something that you need to take into account. And also, I also agree with what, with what you have said, but, and I think that a point is that you need to refine more the dialogues. There are a lot of words that could be misinterpreted, or, and a lot of things that happen or are said that doesn't convey or what is going on, like the time, like, Oh, uh, Maya, how much time you have been away? And for the player, it just has been 30 seconds. So I think that you need to refine a lot more the dialogue in order to give more space for the sensations, to give more time the players to think about. Also, the, there is no interaction between the text that you can see in, in front of you that symbolize the fears. That's a good thing. Also, play a bit more with the fonts just to try to spy things up. She, uh, she's a girl, she's more creative, so also the fonts need to convey their, uh, her way to see the world. And I think that, and I don't know if you have uh, taken that also into account. And uh, this, this is another thing that I wanted also to say to the other team. Narrative games with influencers are great, but at the same time that will take away part of people that may be interested in your game because they will have already seen your story. In your case, you, you have different options with different uh, outcomes in the dialogue. But take, take that into account also in, the, in, in, in your figures that you have about people that will buy your copies. Okay, thank you for your feedback. Um, hello, I'm Aurélien. I'm former associate of Prismatic. We make escape games and board games. Congratulations for this presentation and this game, which is quite nice. I would just have a question. Could you please elaborate a bit more about the concrete consequences of the choice of dialogues and uh, what are the implications on the rest of the, um, of the game and the narration, please? Yes, so for the dialogues, we didn't want it to have uh, too much agency for the players because we already know the story we want to tell and we didn't want to, um, by giving too much freedom, to um, 
uh, make that story uh, less uh, interesting, you know? So our goal was just to have very subtle changes in the parent stone and on uh, Maya's um, uh, view of the world. And so that way you could still uh, feel involved with the story without being able to um, um, destroy it uh, too much, you know? So the maximum changes is I think like uh, at two level branches, I think. We don't go further than that in the slice at least, but perhaps in the other game we could go a bit further than that for uh, subtle um, uh, concepts. Thank you. I will take a question online. So Odile. Yes, thank you. Um, so I had connection problems, so I missed the first minute. So, but I, I, I didn't see any information about you working with a professional psychologist, somebody that knows about the different mental states you are speaking. Because for me, there is a. I, I, I still have trouble to understand your target group and also how the girl. She's a teenager, and she's. Um, but you speak about all the stages of. of preteen, teen, and adult also in your in your story. But it's um, the story is during the couple of, of hours, probably. Um, and also, I think you are tackling a lot of subjects. Like you just said, uh, she will remember it's nice to have parents. Well, I'm not sure that teenagers at some point remember if it's nice to have parents or not. Um, so I, and I'm not a specialist. So I think there is really a point there if you really want to convey something about the stages and the difficult relationship for a teenager and his parents, I, I'm kind of miss um, how you're going to to make it um, to make it an impact. And, and if you really want to have an impact or to have something that that tells that tells something, then I think you should work with a, a psychologic um, a, a psycholo specialist on this. Okay, thank you a lot. Yeah, it's a good, uh, good idea. Uh, hello, Louis, associate producer at Asobo. Uh, I'm sad because someone already asked the question I wanted to, to share with you. Uh, I wanted to know what will be the impact as a player on the story. And okay, I understand your choice. Uh, so great job. It's really nice to see more detail in the environment. Uh, and also your presentation was clear, uh, especially on the mini stories. I understand finally what's the goal, what is the goal. So yeah, congratulations and thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, hello, um, I'm, I'm Ivan Hamuric from Zagreb, Croatia. I'm a game designer. I, uh, by show of hands, if you will indulge me for a second, and I do apologize if you're way ahead of me, uh, how many of you have played or seen South of the Circle? Can you repeat, please? South of the Circle by, by State of Play from London. It's, it's, I think it's very, uh, 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 it's very important for your game because what you're trying to establish, uh, m to some degree, much like the earlier game, the horror game, uh, you're, you're trying to establish an emotional connection with the pl uh, between the player and the character. It's, it's an extraordinarily difficult task in, in video games uh, because, you know, uh, film is the medium of... of uh, uh, games are a medium of uh, agency and film is, is a medium of empathy. You're trying to do both and, and that's admirable. But here are the two big enemies. Not n uh, there are more, but one is expositional dialogue it very much dries up the emotional truth of what you're trying to do. Uh, and this is not a criticism of dialogue per se, it's a structural problem. And uh, I'm not one to criticize dialogue in uh, this publicly normally. Uh, the other is uh, a clever, almost engineering-like approach to UI, uh, especially manifested in Maya's speech bubbles. Um, because you don't have, uh, I, I apologize if, if, if I fail to grasp that, but you don't have any significant divergence in your story. Uh, so essentially, uh, the uh, one of the vectors of drying up the emotional connection between the player and the, and the character is that you're uh, making me, as a player, uh, uh, you're forcing me to parse the, the textual data that's not really important. You know, especially when you uh, clad it in, uh, clothe it in this, uh, in this uh, very, very... Uh, uh, clever, colorful uh, language. The reason you should take a look at South of the Circle is that all of these problems have been addressed in a very, very uh, uh, good way. Uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, just an Apple Arcade exclusive. It is? Yeah, so, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, this should be your first step because uh, these people know how to how to bridge the gap between the, the player and the and the uh, 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 what is the other character in a game. You should take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. I'm running to the next question. Of remarks. The so God Foster comments. I am. I am very happy from your presentation for several reasons. Like for the other game, the progress you made since the last presentation, but also I think you have really heard what was the advice of the jury and taken into account the part of this advice that you thought were important and the one which were less for you. And also I think for the discussion that you are proposing something which is quite original and I should encourage you to send your game for example to the IGF uh, of next year uh, because probably we can discuss about the economy of these games and be sure that there is really a target in terms of economy but what is clear is that you are trying to do something which is original and you have a a good chance to win a prize. Thank you. Hi, uh, Pierre Jean, uh, audio director from Ankama. Uh, so, very good job for uh, the music. It's very cool. Uh, I like uh, the cinematographic aspect. And there are uh, a big work on ambience and texture, so uh, bravo. <laughs> I just have two remarks. Uh, one first thing is about uh, Fales part. I think it's really, really under mix. It's uh, a little bit damaged because um, to have a realistic sound will uh, should be uh, should ampl amplify the contrast between a re real realistic part, uh, sorry, and texture uh, texture vision. No. Uh, we have a lot of te texture, but uh, realistic sound, I don't hear a lot uh, about this part. Uh, the second thing is about voices. I have a strange uh, sensation. Uh, we feel that the girl and her dad are very close, just behind. Is that, uh, uh, that, uh, is that what do you want for the voice? Um, for me, I think uh, you could have more projections uh, for the voice. Uh, you know, the, uh, her dad are, are far away. Uh, and uh, he, it could have amplified the feeling of loneliness for the girl, for example. So do you conduct the record session? And what do you have in mind for the voice part? Thank you for your comments. And uh, regarding that voice part, we, I think we, for the vertical slice, we did with what we have with had, because uh, we had to hire actors that were working in remotely because of the, like, we wanted absolutely English voices and it was very hard to find in France, especially with the tight budget and tight timing that we had. So we just had to hire actors with like a limited amount of acting direction we could have give to them and one of them was to try and not be all the time in front of the mic, especially for the lines which are uh, telling something like, oh Maya, you are, th just go there, stuff like that, because it, it should sound like the dad is actually going far away. And like some actors kind of did it on some lines, but there was no very much consistency on that. And yeah, we didn't have too many much retakes but we are con conscious that it is a thing we should improve for the whole game. And especially we should record the voices ourselves in studio with our own acting, acting director. So we could have full control on that. So yeah, I agree with you. It is not very like successful on this point at the moment. And for the folly parts, uh, it is more a question of also of time and budget and production because I already, already noticed the few comments that uh, we had on the Follies uh, previously, especially from you. 
and unfortunately I didn't have the time to re-record it properly. N I mean, not even using sound banks and taking the time to just replace full the full lot of them because they are a huge lot of them. And so I just decided to go with it and perhaps not putting too much of the emphasis on it so it would stay discreet in the mix and just like, you know, hide the, the defaults under the carpet or something. But this is only in the like scope of the vertical slice. Of course, for the full game, it should be reworked properly with proper budget and timing. Hello, guys. Um, uh, congrats on the work. Um, I, I'm happy that you will like, really listen to some of the feedbacks the jury gave you during the two first presentation. So that's nice. Uh, the color direction overall was pretty nice. Uh, I'm a bit underwhelmed by the like the global work on the texture and the rocks and stuff like this. It's a, it's a, everything feels a bit blurry, and like there is a, uh, some kind of dissonance uh, between like the some textures and the quality of the modeling and stuff like that. But it's stuff to tweak. You had a very very large scope, uh, maybe too big, I think. Um, uh, I had a, I have a question. I'm really happy that we saw the silhouette, finally. <laughs> um, it feels a bit underdeveloped. Uh, I mean, f I don't know what what it is really in terms of tech and and the choice you wa really wanted to do. Uh, do you have plans into improving anything about it, like animating it, something like this? Well, mostly the silhouette needs to be uh, its own character uh, and it's just a time matter. But otherwise, yeah, it just requires a lot of work. So it's time that we were missing. But yeah, it's something we, um, in a bigger game, we would uh, focus on. Hi, um, Eliza from Ubisoft Sh Paris Studio. Um, I have a question about your narrative rhythm. Um, how do you deal with the narrative rhythm in terms of player's exper experience? For example, how are the dialogues scripted? Is it possible for the players to avoid specific trigger? What happens if he do, if he does? I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, the mic wasn't mic. Uh, was mute. Uh, could you just repeat the last part of the question, please? Yeah, um, I was wondering about the narrativism. Um, how did you script the dialogues? Um, what happens if the players just avoid a trigger, if it's possible to avoid a trigger, or um, if he wants to advance while there is still a dialogues uh, going through? Um, here we go. Okay, so in the s in the slice we made, there are always system to um, uh, to avoid that, so you cannot skip any dialogues in the slice. But our goal for the entire game would be to allow players to skip part of the dialogues if they feel like it. But we would have to make sure that they understand that they are skipping important parts of the scenario while doing so. And we also thought at the beginning to uh, have a feature so that uh, the character of Maya could uh, cut her parents uh, when talking so that she could just uh, interrupt them and keep going with the conversation. So we could try some interesting stuff like that to uh, dynamize a bit more the um, dialogue with the parents, yes. And thank you for the question. Hi, uh, Morgan Guerilla Games. Um, I really loved your presentation. It's a game I want to play. I especially like the, the mini games that for me uh, relieves the tension that maybe Maya may be under. Uh, this is uh, very cute and adorable. I do more, I uh, have a question, a uh, more business question. Is there a reason why you're not considering VR as a support? Because this is uh, a game I would love to play uh, with a headset on. Uh, I think we avoid motion sickness. Um, uh Especially, sorry, <laughs> uh, especially um, about uh, for the motion sickness, uh, for uh, the dialogues because you you look up and uh, maybe also for climbing. 
don't know if you want to add something. And even working like that at different paces in small environment could be very motion sickness inducing in VR games. So they always have to introduce other features such as teleporting or other, uh, other ways of locomotion. So it wouldn't really work f uh, as well for our games, I think. That's why we didn't um, thought about the VR for the, for the game. But yeah, I think it can be very interesting, but like uh, um, the player is sitting just, and the game is shorter, like 15 minutes, but uh, to, yeah, to experiment the, the game in a shorter way and, and uh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Morten, I'm from uh, Animation Workshop and Vibo Visuals in Denmark. It's a, it's a great game. I have a, a, a question. Um, I find it both sympath sympathetic and, and great and confusing with the two dads. Uh, and I just want, uh, I mean you, had a, you had a reason for choosing that. Does it have any implication on the psychological choices of the girl? Can you talk a little about this? Um. Uh, th there's no um, impact in game uh, with the choice you, you have in front of you, but uh, we made obviously some research of the kid psychology at the beginning of the production, so we consider that in the, the dialogues. Um, but I, uh, yeah, um, I don't know. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I'm sure I understood the, qu the question about the dads. So you've. You were asking if it was confusing for the players to have two dads at the same time, or I don't understand. No, no it's, uh, it's because she calls them dad and dad. No, she calls them dad and daddy actually, and she also calls them by, your, by their first name. Okay. So we have made sure for the very beginning that we had that, and for the French version, we also have that. She calls them uh, papa and papou to make sure that we have um, <laughs> a clear understanding on who is who. Um, yes, I, I, I was kind of wanted to make the same question, but is um, I think uh, what I like is uh, that it gets very universal and we go out of the family of Epinal, you know, Epinal is mom, dad, and uh, lots of uh, sisters and brothers. This is a sp uh, not a special, but it's a more and more common uh, and universal situation. But what I suggest is because it's uh, still uh, kind of new, situation and we are going into there and my question is um, how how because it's, it's a, a couple which is let's say dad and dad and um, a girl who is adopted so it's a trio which is yeah. uh, okay uh, it's 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 beginning to be um, official and uh, and common and I'm happy for that now it's like it's kind of new and you are living this fantastic era how uh, how in the in the dialogues because there are situations when they say oh you wanted to come to France is very funny you know it's typical discussions of uh, couples not agreeing which is universal but how when I heard that uh, uh, sometimes a psychological advice could be interesting to make this unique she is growing she mm. wants to grow you know what she wants to be as every kid at that age they don't want to be different they want to be I like and and how how um, touching the bottom do, uh, through the dialogues because maybe at that moment they can solve also it's not only climb and go there and it's funny I'm painting but sometimes she can make questions about who we are you know and yeah. uh, and it can be interesting because we are I am kind of expecting this yeah about there is yes. there is there is that in the game and then okay. but it's it's uh, happened in the middle in the game yeah because at the beginning it's mostly the emergency of getting out yes and in the middle of the game uh, she asking herself these questions yeah and uh, she gonna abs accept uh, her family and the situation because um, we obviously uh, look for documentary and stuff about all that and um, but it's not a subject in the game and you, but if you want to to uh, to yeah to I don't know to to see that thing in the game you can but uh, we didn't want to to make some uh, something really uh, really obvious with uh, with this yes. because it was a, it was a bit tricky to write uh, something uh, yes. so that that reason why we didn't want to to plunge uh, deeper in the subject you know 
Yes, I, I think that uh, the belonging, or how, yeah. how they are a tribe and uh, they have to weld this belonging between them yeah. and, yeah. Uh, and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. And final question. Um, hello. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate you because the resemblance and uh, inspiration uh, regarding Firewatch was, uh, in all the good ways, strikingly obvious. And so, very good job. Uh, however, I have a question regarding skippable, uh, not skippable, the way dialogue works. When you when you are in dialogue and you wait too long of a time, how do you deal with the player not giving an input? So yes, for this version of the dialogues, we wanted to um, l um, have the player uh, be able to take the time wha when choosing because we don't want to induce any more stress than the game currently has. And so the idea is that the the time is basically freeze when you have to answer a question, you know, and you can just take your time and answer anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This was the last um, question of the morning, and let's congrats <laughs> the team again. So congratulations to the three teams of this morning, and uh, we are looking forward to hear the three remaining ones. Uh, so we will have a short break, but anyway, try to go and s visit the box. Uh, 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 go test the games you've seen this morning during lunch break, and we will see all again at a quarter past two, so it's in uh, about um, one hour and 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Hi again. Hi again. It's it's is it working? No. It's a test. Hi again. So we have three more uh, project to hear this afternoon, and so let's come the first one left behind. Okay, so welcome and hello everyone and welcome to the final presentation of our game Left Behind. So with Left Behind, we have decided to create a dark science fiction tale set on an unknown planet. So to enhance the narration and the staging of our adventure, we have chosen the cinematic platformer genre, to which belong the games Gris and Inside. And especially because we wanted to bring the atmosphere, the environments, the sound and the music design to the forefront. Left Behind takes place on a mysterious planet called Holoqua 5, which is used as a garbage dump. Unfortunately, all the pollution has led to mysterious mutations of the environment. Our main character, Christine, is an agronomist in her 30s. During her adventure, she experiences a strange mutation while she tries to get back home from this mysterious planet. For now, we are Afghan Studio, a double A indie, indie video game studio. And as a work hypothesis, we have chosen to be associated with Sony Interactive Entertainment. Indeed, we wanted to focus our work on the new PS5 features, 
Uh, this has been a technical challenge for our programmers and was a great means to enhance our game's intentions. This partnership also allows us to expect a great visibility uh, marketing-wise, thanks to Sony. So now let's dive into the scenario. To quickly sum up the scenario, Christine got ejected in an escape pod and has landed on a strange planet. So she, she is trying to get back home. In the game, as she crosses polluted environments, Christine starts mutating. The mutation affects her physically, but also her humanity. And throughout the game, as she transforms and keeps on exploring, the origin and consequences of this pollution slowly unveils. Besides some more details about the lore, the planet Christine crashed onto is Holoqua 5, as we said before, which is a garbage planet. On this garbage planet, there are out of order titans, gigantic robots that were used to terraform planets. With time, these titans release a strange polluting liquid called superfuel. So here is a sample diagram to sum up our main guideline. The action takes place on the Holoqua 5. We follow Christine, who gets exposed to superfuel, and slowly mutates over time. It is important to understand that the core of the game is the evolution of the character's physique and skills. We can, now, we can now dive deeper into the scenario. At the very beginning, Christine crashes on the planet. She tries to call her, her company, but gets exposed to superfuel. As she mutates, she progressively loses her humanity. Her company, Arfken, has left her behind. She's getting desperate. In the last third of the game, Christine finds a, a working titan and measured with it, she has nothing to lose, and it's a success. She now controls the titan. As a last result, she tries to grasp the ship. It fails, the titan crumbles, she now has to find a new meaning to her life on this planet. And that is the game, that is the end of the full game we wrote it. Here's a diagram of the narrative intensity for the full game. We can see the different events on the timeline, as well as the different environments written at the bottom. So to achieve a consistent game production, we have set three main intentions to which we refer before taking any decisions. Experience a long rush through immense environments. Embody our character and explore their transformation. And finally, discover and question how West is handled in this world. So here is our plan to deliver a fraction of the full game in our vertical slice. We keep the very beginning, Christine crashes. Then, after a short temporal ellipse, we find back Christine halfway in the game. She is strongly mutating. Last, we explicitly reveal the existence of Titans at the end by a cliffhanger, which is interrupted by very brutal credits. Okay, so time to jump into the gameplay part. We've said it before, Left Behind is a cinematic platformer, but what does it imply gameplay-wise? The main component of a cinematic platformer are a fine-tuned character controller with a good game feel, some additional light gameplay like pushing crates, for example. A particular attention is also given to staging, the global mise en scène. And don't forget the environment, which should help convey the story. As we've already mentioned, Christine mutates throughout the game because of the superfuel, a highly polluting futuristic energy, energy source. This transformation is our game's key selling point. It affects different aspects of the game and is clearly visible through Christine's appearance, which changes over time, as you can see on the screen. But now, let's see how the mutations affect the gameplay too. We are making Christine's character controller evolve over time to reflect her current at her current mutation state. We have these three main states and we are planning to make multiple in between when needed for pacing. What we want to achieve is making the player feel the mutation through their controller. And for this, we'll be using this game feel evolution we just explained, but also to make them feel it more literally, we'll use the capacity of the PS5 controller. To make the player really feel like they embodies our character and their mutation, we are using the DualSense haptics. We developed a Unity plugin to implement adaptative triggers, which have force feedback, 
sound coming out of the gamepad, thanks to the controller integrated speaker, LED colors around the touchpad of the controller, and also high definition vibration gener generated with sound waves. So it allows the stereo vibration on the controller. The adaptive triggers are already used at two different moments in the vertical slice to move object. They are firstly set at, at a high resistance to mimic the weight of the object, and then to a rumbling resistance to feel the object rattling on the floor. But since the plugin already implements them, we could easily add other kinds of force feedback interaction within the full, the full game. In the sequence where Christine is suffering, the sound of her coughing and her voice lines are emitted directly from the controller. This is also the case for all the footsteps and voice lines in the two other zones. In addition to the sounds of the controller, the high definition vibration allowed to accentuate the footstep and, the sound and all the sounds of the game. The intensity of the vibrations varies according to the surface on which Christine's runs, and since it's based on a stereo sound, it is also specialized at the impact of his left, her left, and right foot. With this mechanic, we want to incent the player to reflect on the environment in the future and the adaptability of the human being. Mutations come from the exposure to the superfuel. They force a painful physical transformation on Christine, and it is a forced trade, her humanity for a more adapted moveset. But even if Christine's might get new physical abilities, it is not portrayed as a good thing because it is forced and it brings her obvious pain. About the level design now. During the whole game, Christine will go through very different environments, six in total, chained up progressively. And since we are making a cinematic game, the idea is to make all these changes in one unique sequence shot without any cut. For the vertical slice, we are creating shorter version of the zones. We also design, decided to only keep four of them in a concern of projection time. Between each of them, for the player to feel the mutation during the temporal ellipses, we are designing short audio and haptic cinematics. In the left behind, the positioning of the camera, the framing, the depth of field, and the transition is a real challenge. To support our intention of creating a game with a cinematic look and dramatic storyline, we opted to a 25 to 10 aspect ratio, which results in a voluntary appearance of black bands on most conventional screens. Now let's have a quick overview of the different camera angle we are using in Love Behind. During the only dialogue sequence in the game, as opposed to Christine's monologues, the camera is positioned in a three-quarter view and close to the character's shoulder. This setup helps to reinforce the player's projection into Christine during her distress call. Most of the time in the game, the camera is positioned in a relatively side view to follow Christine. We also added a slight offset to keep the character in that specific area of the screen to follow the rule of thirds and to read more easily the scrolling environment with potential obstacles. This example shows the widest show of life behind. Here our intention was to create a short period of contemplation for the player by shifting the gaze from Christine to the huge environment in the background. To introduce a nice sense of immensity, we wished we played with the atmospheric perspective, the fog values and the frame composition which all converge towards a central vanishing point. Moreover, the transition between the cameras are frequent and often very progressive, which makes the game very dynamic and varies the player's emotion according to what they see on screen. Thankfully, Cinemachine offers a nice freedom of camera management, and we have made a few tools to make sure the transitions are exactly as intended. As a cinematic platformer, with lots of feedbacks, the main appeal is to discover the story and how it will be told and felt. With a fun and reactive character controller, and where the difficulty is not the main appeal of the game. Thus, the puzzles are mainly used for passing and variety and are not supposed to be a challenge to be overcome. Christine 
as regular monologues in the game. Their role is to allow deeper characterization as well as conveying backstory hints to the player. Each voice line is done by Etel Oubier, the French voice of Penelope Cruz. Moreover, for the sake of accessibility, each voice line is also subtitled in white font on a black background. Here is a short preview of one of them. Ah, there's a signal. This is going to be a few feet from here. Good. So now let's dive into the visual and sound universe of the game. Our game has a very pictorial art direction. Indeed, we think that it adds value of, to our universe and blends well with the intention of our story. For this, we use two techniques. First one, a, a post-process that blends the color together according to the distance. And second, in our final version, we will have a mix of 2D and 3D assets textured in a very rough pictorial style. The same painting rules apply to our character. With distance, the character's texture will have a more pronounced and rosy paint effect. This will give him much more impact and readability, even if the character is small. Our initial intention for Left Behind was about having different environments, each of them having their own features, which includes colors, plants, ambience, etc. This, in these varied environments, all interactive elements will have a green color to differentiate them. This way, the player will immediately know what to do when faced with an obstacle. In our colored palette, orange represents humanity, our connection to humans, while blue represents superfuel and loss of humanity. The further you get into the game, the less human Christine becomes. In our story, the Titan will change the fate of Christine. They are gigantic robots that have been used to transform the inhabited planets. Now they are abandoned in Holocra 5, powering the super fuel that makes Christine mutate and most of the environment around. They will arise a question about the adaptability of Christine and her will to fusionate with them in order to stay alive on the planet. For the sound, the sound diegesis has a thin enough border to establish a particular atmosphere. We pay attention to the environmental effect to detail what we do not see but which nevertheless surrounds us. We opted for a hyperrealistic sound and follies, the objective of which was to fuel the dark and eerie aspect of the settings. <laughs> The challenge is probably to adapt the sound of the space to the space Christine is in to give that sense of reality. Stop it! You will die! As the game progresses, we use a contrapuntal process, contrasting audio with visuals, to create the feeling of an alternate reality in our hands. Acousmatic sound, sound without a clear visual origin, can inspire us to look in the direction of a sound. To be a cinematographic experiences, the music brings dynamics in the whole game to mark the different states that our characters go through. This is done through evolving musical motifs that will be cut into stems by thematic music. The use of microtonality with slight fluctuation, like a sound cloud, blurs the multiple lines, and that constitute it to confuse the listener and bring him to put himself in the place of the character. And now regarding the marketing and management. After doing some research on our target audience, we estimated to be people around 15 to 35 years old with a liking for artistic and narrative-driven games, and with preferences for ambience and games experiences. Given this information, our core target looks for a unique story and wants simple and clear directions, 
while our main target looks for an experience, meaning of the design, and is here for the journey. They want the, to feel empathy toward their character. Left behind is a platformer like Limbo, but has less puzzles mechanics than Little Nightmares, which explain its position on the graphic. However, Left Behind can stand out by its narration, turn around the character's progression, its hand painting artistic direction, its haptic immersion thanks to the PS5 rumble and adaptive triggers. Moreover, Left Behind is a breath of fresh air for the PlayStation exclusivities catalog by being the unique representative of the cinematic platformer's games. As we said before, Left Behind has six distinct areas for a game life of around three hours, close to what Planet Alpha has to offer. Regarding the selling price, we benchmarked uh, our competitors from different supports, as well as PlayStation exclusive, that led us to an estimated selling price of 15 euros. Our final estimate for the entire project is 800,000 euros, with a team of 12 for 18 months of development and the number of self of, of about 300,000 copies. Left Behind would be a premium game with a base price of 15 euros, taking into account the percentage of distribution costs, discounts and other taxes, the average income would be about 5 euros. With these numbers, the break-even point would amount to 160,000 copies. To complete all six zones and all animation in the game, we have evaluated an 18-month production, so we want to release the game in April 2023. To strengthen the game artistic team, we have recruited an additional 3D artist student, Camille Logov gauthier from January. In addition, we plan to recruit a 3D animator starting in March to take care of the various animations of our main character. Concerning the UX UI design, we are planning to reduce the number of staff as there is no big deal need for UI design on these projects due to the absence of HUD. After all we have said, I think you can appreciate the game. Before it starts, we want to warn you, this game includes loud sound and representation of increasing violent panic attacks that may be disturbing for those who among themselves may have had similar experiences. Mommy's coming home. Are you 
kidding me? Okay. In and out. that you got her ride earlier wasn't a bright idea, but still. Agronomy speaking. <coughs> My escape pod ejected. I'm I'm on a planet named Oloqua 5. <coughs> I need <coughs> emergency assistance and medical care. Well, you make a situation in knowledge. However, we regret to inform you that according to your contract's terms and conditions, you will have to wait for the proper incident declaration from the flight company. Thank you for your patience. What? But that may take days. Uh, I need help right now. Uh, I'm slowly changing. And According to your location data, you are currently on a territory marked as extremely hazardous. Please understand that due to safety measures, this may cause delays.
In conclusion, our game is centered on Christine's mutation. It affects her design, but also the gameplay. Her movement will be accelerated and amplified. Her sound and behavior will be affected by it too. We hope to conceive a narrative experience for our players to enjoy. I will now present you the team. I have by my side Santiago and Noemi, the game artists, Jan, the sound and music designer, Mathieu and Panfil, the programmers, Laurent, the project manager, uh, Leo and Nicolas, the game designer, Benoit, the user researcher who isn't here today, and myself the, as uh, the UI designer. That is all for Left Behind's presentation. We hope you will like it and thank you for your attention. So who wants to start? First questions, comments? Yes. Oh, hi. Jaime from Madrid is that. Uh, first of all, congratulations. And congratulations, Clara, for still being here again and again in all presentations. It's always good to rely that you will be there. Uh, at the same time, I, I will have just a question, but uh, this is a good question. Why some of you are transformed and the rest of you are humans in your avatars? But that's maybe a question for another time. Uh, I just wanted to point out one thing, and one thing that you need to take into account. Uh, your game is story driven. You have already told us the narrative part is very important. So please take care of that. Like for example, in the trailer that you have shown us, uh, the few things that she have told is first rule, avoid contact with superfuel. The first thing she does, go to contact with superfuel. So try to go around, of course, she needs to get in contact with the super field. But uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, let her try to build uh, some kind of boat and in the middle of the, uh, of the trip it breaks down so it enters in contact with the super field. But take care of it. Take care of it because it's, it's really important. And also uh, what was told before um, by Ivan uh, about uh, try to know to make so much dialogue very expositive because it breaks down the immersion of and the illusion of being able to experience the game that you are playing but at the same time it's amazing how much things have changed and how many things you have taken into account the things that have been pre previously said by other jurors in the previous presentation so con uh, above all else congratulations Thank you for your feedback. So I will just uh, answer to your question about the character. So it was just the five first person who asked to be blue. So it's just that. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Just, just uh, to add a few things uh, about, uh, well, it's clear from your chat also. In that sense, uh, you have a two-dimensional world, three-dimensional world. Uh, when you have to go through the super fuel, it's because you have no choice as long as you have uh, just one way to go. Uh, when you climb to one of the rifts, uh, I can climb when wherever I want, or I have to go straight to the place I can climb. How do I know I can climb over there? And at the same time, when we, we saw the pipes getting into the horizon, I would like to go over there if I was a player. And in that sense, how do you prevent the player not to go where he wants? Because if you have a 2D or 3D limits, uh, you need to mark them quite well. Uh, can, if you can explain it further, the, the movement and the 2D, 3D dimensional opportunities for the player, so nice. Anyway, nice work. You, as Jaime says, you have a, you have done a lot of progression since the last time, so you are in the right direction. Thank you. if I get it correctly, your question is how do we prevent players from going where we don't want them to go, right? Okay, so it's not, maybe it's not that explicit in the video, but we're using a track system and the player, the character can only go from left to right. So that prevents the player from going anywhere else. And we try to build uh, the, our different levels 
like uh, to suggest the player the way it should go. I don't know if I'm clear enough. But for example, yes, the super fuel, uh, you have to cross it. That's the only way forward. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your feedback. Um, hello. Um, uh, great work since the last presentation. Clearly, you've done a lot. Um, so a, a few comments about uh, uh, the global art. Uh, um, you really heard uh, le, the feedbacks. So that's, that's really nice. I'm really happy that you talked about composition about the cinematic platformer. I really appreciate that you talked about the camera, camera angles, the way you handle it and stuff. So uh, I think you learned a lot uh, into focusing those points. Uh, same for the terrain, it's at a bit more interest and stuff. So clearly you, you heard many feedbacks. Um, still, I think I'm... Um, I think you 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 count you were counting too much on the um, on the depth effect with the painter painterly style. Uh, you were really counting on it. Uh, on the background, it has its effect. On the but the the contrast with the foreground, I mean with everything that is around the actual avatar, it's uh, like the style is really not blending well with the background. I think you need uh, a bit more stylized artistic direction to have a better blending, you know, in the shapes. Everything feels very like high density, very straight and very earth-like, like the antenna, for example, like they looked like the cathodic TV antenna uh, that we had back in the 90s <laughs> and before. Um, so yeah, I think like it could help having some more artistic intention on the 3D layer uh, to blend better with the rest. But other than that, great progress. Thank you. Oh, very thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I think we have to do more stylized maybe uh, assets uh, because this one uh, was uh, for the major part, uh, not from us. and. Uh, we we bought them because we didn't have time and uh, the team for that. So yeah, maybe uh, well we will uh, work the asset again and have more stylized thing. But um, like in the um, layers, uh, the, um, they, they are really thin. So this not this is not really good for our. Um, our direction, so we want uh, the future asset to be more large. Thank you. Um, hello, it's uh, Cesar from uh, Asobo. Um, so I agree with everything that's been said uh, about like the super fuel crossing it. Uh, it doesn't make much sense that she says she doesn't want to go and then she goes. But uh, and the environment. Um, one thing I would like to say is the colors. Um, I really, I don't know. I don't know if it comes from a, a lack of lighting, maybe, uh, or something, maybe a post-process, something. But your colors, they don't really work together, and uh, it makes the environment not, not as pretty as it could be without changing anything from the, like anything except the colors. So, I would advise you to check your colors. I don't know. Your presentation looks great, but the game, the colors, and the, the lighting, I don't know. Something's off, probably. Probably an environment art would probably have a better explanation as to why, but I, I can see it. Uh, but otherwise, cool game. I'd like to try it. Looks cool.
So good job, good job. Um, I just, do you hear me? Uh, I just want to say thank you for your feedback. We uh, tried uh, several techniques. Well, first, there was this uh, post-processed shader, which was <coughs> which was quite heavy, and then we uh, reworked the textures of the asset we we took, and that gave us a, a strong mix that uh, we tried to control. But um, nevertheless, it um, it um, it escapes sometimes the the, the initial the initial intention. Uh, Otherwise, if you uh, in the early concepts, we wanted uh, something quite colorful. In, in any case, maybe not so bright, but uh, but something even if we if we say it's a dark cinematic platformer, remain a bit colorful. So let's say it was more or less 50-50. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, um, I have a question. I'm here. Okay, it's uh, for sound. I'm Thierry, a freelance uh, sound designer. And the question is, uh, if I stay for a long time at the same spot on your game, uh, what's uh, happening uh, sound-wise and music-wise, especially? Concerning the music, uh, it's uh, a stems systems. So it can be removed at the beginning if uh, you stay in the, the same place. But uh, concerning the sound design, there are some uh, feedbacks of uh, follies and uh, rest, and uh, it's only uh, these things. And, uh, so there, there is a loop system for the music, or the yeah, no, no, it's a no. system with uh, stems, stems with uh, um, different parts of uh, music. But if you stay in the, the same place, uh, it can be removed at the beginning because it's a loop. Uh, uh, How long is the loop, just for cu curiosity? It depends uh, the place, but uh, maybe like 30 seconds, 30 seconds uh, to one minute. It depends because uh, you can uh, cut uh, the music into th the bar for the changement in transition and uh, maybe for the, the step uh, to. Uh just uh, one remark for uh, maybe uh, all project uh, i missed uh, the um, the technical aspect of sound and uh, the so the the technical uh, side of w how do you make it and wha what what is the uh, the technical uh, the mm, what do you use behind so okay uh, it's uh, for all sound design or sound the design music, yeah. music part both both okay uh, concerning the sound uh, um, uh, there are few um, few sounds of uh, the character because we really want to center the attention of uh, for the character. So uh, there is much of uh, Foley's uh, a system of breath, dynamic system for for breathings, uh, and uh, much uh, voices and uh, months months. And uh, for the ambience, uh, we have different step of uh, layer. Uh, there are combine uh, uh, depending the the place who yeah, the character is. My question was about the technology. Is it wise? Ah, is it F mode? Sorry, sorry. Because sorry. I have not seen anywhere the, the uh, these words. Yeah, yeah, it's a wise. Okay, thank you. Yeah, wise. Sorry. <laughs> Pardon. <laughs> I'd like to add that it also it was also wise that we use for the uh, the whole the uh, haptic relation with the but in part because the all of the vibration of the dual sounds are made through stereo sounds so we used wise for that too and uh, since uh, you asked if you could play it uh, later after all the presentation you can come on the plateau project and test it with the experiences with uh, the dual sounds gamepad too uh, hello, uh, Ivan Hamaric again from Zagreb, Croatia, game designer. Uh, I'm curious about a couple of things. First, and I do apologize, I, I, I missed the beginning. Um, th this, this has uh, an, uh, is this an homage to, to Journey at, in, in some degree? Because the illustration is quite iconic, and when you have a lot of light yellow and one small red thing, it's obviously Journey. Th was that on purpose, or? Do you mean what it's? The does Johnny was a reference for our yeah, game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh -huh. We benchmarked it for the um, 
a very human environment and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say that our main very reference would be inside games. Uh, okay. Not inside games, but inside. Sure. Uh, yeah, but it, we took Jordan to account before taking the before li making you the game. Yes. Okay, well, fair yeah. enough. It's not a criticism. The other thing is, uh, your beginning, and perhaps this is just a choice for your vertical slice. That's fine. But you know, the the idea of the main character in such a left to right game, laying down and being awoken by the first input, is 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 really tropey. And unless you have a really, really good presentation or dramaturgical reason for it, you know, uh, you could take a day and just write a different beginning. You know, we could perhaps not not now, but we could perhaps uh, uh, take a second or two later. You know, and uh, uh, just unless you have a strong reason for it, avoid the trope. You know, everybody does it. Uh, also, sorry, the the last question: Have you played Stella? Sorry, Stella, S T E L A. Stella? It's a female name. She's the, she's the main character. Take uh, take a look at the game. It was for Xbox. Well, are you familiar? If you're familiar, then great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Aurelien. I'm still making escape games. Thank you for your presentation and your game. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the ways, game design wise, you plan to keep the player engaged apart from the discover the part where the player discovered the story how do you keep the player engaged in the game uh, so this is something we've tried to challenge in the game and we think w well let's say the first element would be changing the way the character moves over time like providing the player with different let's say styles i think it can like generate a regenerate a bit of interest in some fresh air and the puzzle and future enigmas we plan to have in the full game would be something to keep the player engaged as well like let's face it the main interest of the game would be how you unveil the story and the different elements but these different gameplay elements would be there to have a nice little pacing. Thank you. I think it, that was the last question. So let's congrats the team once again. <laughs> and let's welcome the next team, Amo. And while the team is coming down, I will uh, give you what the, our colleagues from UTAD prepared for you, uh, guys. So here it is. Test, test. Files copy. Yes, uh, we are copying all the content to the PC, so. 
but no worries, your patience will be rewarded. This is going to be so cool. So I will just seize the opportunity to remind you that you, uh, for the people who don't have a train to, to catch, you are really welcome to test the games again after the end of the session of this afternoon. So uh, all the students are going to wait for you then. I wasn't long enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, I would like to thank for your attention well in advance, all the esteemed juries and the cheerful members of the audience. It's time to believe in magic. FPS, roguelike, and a sandbox. Um, welcome to Ammo, a modern mage out. M primarily being a first-person shooter, Ammo is aimed towards players who enjoy fast-paced, snappy moments. And uh, recently booming, the roguelite formula is for uh, risk-takers. And finally, being a sandbox, it's a paradise for theory crafters. So what is Ammo? The age of mages and witches is long gone. The industrial uh, revolution is rapidly making magic obsolete. The skies are dominated by high-rise Gothic cathedrals, towers, and heavily industrialized structures. Your city floats high in the sky, dominated by uh, religious orders and crafty political groups. The brutally industrialized world has no room for miracles. The uh, religious cults, uh, and ordinary humans are trying hard to overthrow mages and magic. The mages are just another brick in the wall. Overpowered and enslaved, the mages must work tirelessly in armament and ordnance factories, using their abilities for manufacturing ammunition. And who are you in this uh, rat's maze of industry and technology? You play as a mage with a gift for conjuring bullets and ordnance enslaved and oppressed by the industries. You are exploited and angry, but your rage is futile against your slavers. However, you are not alone. You have crossed paths with a parasitic demon with dark capabilities, struggling to survive. You have no other option but to rely on each other. The demon has to survive, and the mage demands firepower to fight. Even though a mage, you have to go tooth and nail against industrialization by some classic gunslinging, but with a twist. Your gun is home to a demon, making it into a living entity, adaptive and fueled by its dark powers. 
The gun itself is an uh, amalgam of magic and technology. Hence, it exhibits very organic aesthetics, which personify the demon itself. With so much firepower, you don't want to be on the business end of this gun. Now, how does this transfer to our game? So to do that, to experience this mage, we have uh, chosen some experience pillars. Uh, first, we want an experience of finding freedom. You are in jail and you want to gain this freedom. This freedom of play style, this freedom of movement and of pacing. Finding this freedom will mean that as a player, you will find room to express yourself. We want you to find your own play style and to discover who you can be in an FPS genre. To reward your individuality, we want you to feel stylish through whatever you have chosen. And all of this comes down to our core system, which is bullet crafting. So how does this uh, happen? We are a roguelike game, which means we are using the classic run sequence. Uh, so you do a run, and if you die, you start again from the beginning. So this is how a run is. You have three different zones, and each one of them has the same pattern. Uh, the first zone we will go through is the ammunition factory, where we are escaping. Then we will go in the upper city, where usual people live, and is guarded by um, military forces. And the last zone is the temples, where religious elite forces high in the sky will try to stop us. So this is um, a first, uh, the first zone of a run. Uh, as you can see, it consists of the repetition of a pattern. Uh, first is the haze. Um, it's a place uh, conjured by its demon inside the gun, and it's a safe place where you can craft and try new ammunition. Then we have combat rooms. In these combat rooms, we will fight enemies, and if we succeed, we will reward new unlocks through uh, an unlock tree, which will allow us to gain new components to craft again. And this repeats. At the end of each zone, we happen to have a boss room, which is a longer and harder fight. Now, let's take a look at the haze and how we craft and try. So, so, so without further ado, let's open a portal into the bullet crafting dimension. When you enter the haze, the safe room, you will have access to one of such bullet crafting stations where you can mm, craft your bullets. And you can, mm, you can do that by using some bullet crafting components. The components come in different families, uh, which are mainly the cores, which uh, define the primary behavior of the bullet. Then are the firing modes, which define uh, how the bullet will be fired from your gun. And lastly, the other um, modifiers, um, which, uh, which define what happens when the bullet impacts on something or after the bullet has been fired. So let's take a look at some examples. So mm, firstly, we have the mm, gravity-affected core. And with this core, the bullets are affected by mm, gravity. Uh, the Newtonian physics are applied to this bullet. Uh, next is a dash core. Uh, the dash core thrusts you in the direction you are pointing at. It is very useful and nifty for mobility and platforming. When it comes to the firing modes, uh, firstly we have shotgun, which makes you fire a buckshot, which are several projectiles in a spread. Uh, we have, then we have the classic international bestseller, the fully automatic, which fires all the bullets in continuation like a machine gun. For additional modifiers, we have different elements like the electric modifier. N try not to be shocked, but this packs some sparks in the bullet, which can have status effects on the enemies. Uh, we also have the heavy modifier, which, is, which even though is a more meta-level component, which multiplies the abilities of the current build and packs a heavier punch into it. And keep in mind, all of this is purely systemic which means you can use any of these components with any others to make the build of your dreams. Your imagination is your limit. And all these components are not just extravagant visually, but they also add to a very natural gameplay feeling as well. All thanks to the dynamic weapon field system. 
each component has firstly the sound layer, which describes how what is happening, and it has a unique sound feeling to it. Then we have some gameplay statistics like the damage, recoil, accuracy, rate of fire, etc. And lastly, we have an extremely intricate recoil behavior, which adds to the unique feeling of the gun. And when we co combine uh, several such components, all these different sound layers, statistics, and recoil content are systemically and procedurally added up into our final bullet build. This is also one of the ways we balance the bullet crafting. We adjust the recoil as well as other statistics to limit the overpowering builds and vice versa. Now let's take a look at some examples of these systems in action. In this example, the, the player is using a gravity bullet with a multi-shot firing mode and uh, explosion, the fire and electric elements as well. And, uh, uh, and our system supports stacking as well. That means if you choose uh, multiple uh, modules of the same type, they will add a stack effect. Let's head over to the next example. In this example, the player is using a straight hit scan bullet, which is not affected by gravity. He can fire it in a fully automatic mode, and he, he's using a bounce modifier so that they bounce off the wall. This is all systemic and works with each other. And uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, uh, this is balanced by the uh, uh, ammunition consumed as well. The more, uh, the more powerful or, uh, or, or heavier bullet build is, the more ammunition it consumes from the magazine. Yeah, thank you. So if you remember this run sequence, you know what comes next. It's a combat room, so let's talk a bit about combat. Uh, for the vertical slice and what you'll get to experience uh, on our stand, you'll get to play inside of the boss room that you've seen in the trailer also. So let's talk about enemies. Uh, let's have an overview of the challenges the players will face. Uh, we've thought of them in three different categories. The first one being movement. Enemies need to add pressure, so players need to dodge, hide, and find the best spot to shoot. Also reactions, uh, players will need to determine when to shoot and move and what to target. And of course, we are an FPS game, so aim is important. You'll need to track the enemies, track their, tra their trajectories, and hit their weakest points. Uh, but remember how freedom is such a huge pillar for us? Well, we are letting players focus on their strongest or preferred areas with our build options. So one example, if you have a lot of movement and you're using a shotgun, uh, then you don't rely on aim that much because you can get close to the enemies and unload a buckshot inside of their body. So let's have a few examples, the one we have in the vertical slice. This is the Seeker. Uh, they are the autonomous surveillance system of the jail factory, the first level. And they are watching workers, uh, but you have a gun in hand, so they'll just attack you on sight. Um, their role is to disrupt the, play the player strategy, but hopefully there are several ways of dealing with it. Uh, their behavior is very simple. They get close, and then they hurt you real bad. Uh, the laser has no travel time, so it's very hard to dodge, uh, almost impossible. Uh, but your available options is to either run and hide behind a wall or a pillar, or you can just hit the seeker and it will cancel the attack. So they will force players to make decisions, basically. As you see, each time you hit the seeker, it stops the animation. And if you hit right inside of the visa, the visor, sorry, uh, there is an eye. And if you hit it, you get this red hit marker, which deals more damage. We call that a critical hit. Very ingenious. Um, so let's talk about our boss, which is called the Gatekeeper. Uh, it's the first zone boss, so it's not the hardest of the whole run, but it's here. It's big, it's heavy, and heavily protected, and players will have to exploit its, fo its flaws. Uh, it will use doors as shields to defend and strike laser beams and poisonous smoke. And of course, seekers will also be part of the fight just to make sure players have a really hard time. This is him, um, 
one more thing is that it fires uh, its lasers with the eyes on the doors, but when it reaches 50% health, uh, then it uses its own eye to fire one additional laser beam. And its own uh, weak point is its glowing abdomen. Uh, if you hit it, you get a critical hit as well. But it's surrounded by its metallic legs, which uh, trigger glancing hits, which actually deal less damage. So you, again, have to make a choice between a high-risk, high-reward option or a safer one and more consistent one, which is hitting the torso, which deals standard damage and don't move as much. Uh, we also added one more layer in the combat with the use of status effects, which are tied to the use of elements. Uh, you've seen fire and electricity. Uh, so how it works is it depends on the enemy. Uh, we have the standard enemies and the boss ones. Uh, for electricity, if you hit a seeker, it's just it just deactivates. And then there is a delay between it, uh, the next attack. It's also slowed down, so it's more easy to shoot at. But if you hit the boss with electricity, it will instead feel a stun gauge, which is displayed under the health gauge. And once this stun gauge is full, then it will get stunned. Yeah, and then you can hit it as much as you want for a brief period of, ti of time. So now let's talk a bit about the levels players will get to explore and fight in. So I'll just continue with the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper room. So again, we've tried to empower players' agency with several options inside of the level design. So for example, you have pillars to hide. You can climb up and use the verticality using the stairs. Or we've thought about putting shortcuts inside of the level design that players can use if they have mobility options inside of their builds. So they are re rewarded for using them. And for the level art, we've used high ornamentation. And we got inspired by Cathedral uh, with a very high architecture. And it's uh, a real imposing place to be in. So this is the room seen from up in the sky. You can have this view inside the game. Maybe you'll see how later. And so back to the haze where you get to respawn in once you've failed or if you succeed. And we've kept a lot of elements uh, between the two levels. Uh, though the haze provides an eerie feeling and still is a bit welcoming, you can see on the right image, to players for more experimentation and upgrades. And for the level design, we've tried to create a space where players could really experiment all the situations they might run into in the real world. I mean, of the game, of course. So they can recreate the combat um, they might want to be put into here. Okay, so a quick look at what we have done for the vertical slice. So as you know, our game is a roguelike, so it needs quite a, a lot of content. Uh, so, but for the vertical slice, we want what we wanted to demonstrate the most is how powerful is the crafting system. So this was our main focus. This is why we have only one combat level on one boss on one enemy, and the level generation was only handcrafted. Uh, if we were to go for the full game, we would dive into procedural generation. Uh, as I said, the crafting system was the main topic, so that's why we have already 22 components in it. Uh, and we plan on having approximately 100 in the full game, uh, including variants, etc. Uh, for the community content, we didn't do anything yet, though the objective is to have some modding capabilities and Twitch integration to enhance the social potential. And uh, now? for the target audience and marketing positioning. Um, we, for our targeted segment, we wanted to prioritize FPS and roguelite enthusiasts, but also players who enjoy creating and exploring the endless possibilities of uh, that game offers. We also encourage socializers to create and share on the game through streaming and sharing their exploit on the, on the game. We did a benchmark on our segment and competitors on the indie and FPS roguelite market. In our quadrant, our competitors are all game with a high replayability rate. We offer a game that can attract players who desire a lot of content and explore and experiment more. So uh, now let's talk, talk about our business plan. So um, we plan a prediction on 20 months with a start of the production for June 2022. 
uh, Kickstarter will be uh, launched just after that. Uh, we will produce the game zone by zone and provide an alpha access to our biggest support on Kickstarter. Uh, and the game should be launched the next year, May 2023, after an early access to all Kickstarters. Here is the project staffing evolution through the project development. Uh, we will reach our max capacity at the beginning of the production, up to 12 people, and we'll keep it for almost all the development of the game. We establish a production cost under 650,000 euros, and we plan to sell the game for 24.99 euros. Uh, this price is based on the lower price of our competitors. We think uh, we should uh, have uh, our uh, break-even point around uh, t for around a bit more than uh, 100,000 sales. And reach 250,000 sales should generate around 1 million euros, uh, which means a uh, return on investment of around 1. Uh, we are aiming, aiming to get uh, an indie publisher uh, used to engage medium budgets uh, in development studio uh, with an international outreach. Uh, we also would like an editor uh, with marketing skills so that we can work together on the communication around the game. And we think that our game could interest such editors uh, to develop their catalog. So now let's, talk, uh, let's see what we have in our vertical slice. Uh, so I'm going to describe the gameplay. So first of all, um, what we are seeing is the player number one and his playthrough. So currently we, we are in the haze, the test room, and the player is exploring the different uh, components and the overall bullet crafting itself. Uh, uh, this player is uh, this player is a more s s strategic player who likes to be safe than sorry. Uh, he's not exactly re reckless. He likes to think. He likes to develop a strategy and play according to it. So uh, in this, uh, uh, for uh, for one barrel of the gun, the player chooses a automatic and mm, critical hit. And and he, here the player is going for a. Uh, for a shield build for a more in defensive approach. And as there are different elements, uh, you can combine the elements with the other, uh, other entities to, uh, to add the effect to it. So here we can see a fiery shield. And now as the player has uh, added an explosion modified to it, we can have a small explosion at the base of the shield as well. S satisfied with, the, with his build, the player is now into the boss room. Mm, now let's watch it unfold.
<coughs> Thank you. Well, because we didn't focus on the progression and instead wanted to show you that you can actually have different builds that all work and all fit different play styles, uh, we recorded several play tests of several people that plays differently. So we're going to show you some more. Uh, now let's start with the... Okay, so this is a very different player. Uh, just so, uh, just to remind you, uh, there is no progression, which means you enter the boss room with full health, which might not be the case in a roguelike. You might enter it with like very little health left. And same for the components, you have access to all of them when in the true game, you'll need to unlock all of them uh, after playing each uh, and every combat room before the boss room. So this is a player that tried to basically put all the damage together. And what happens if you do that is you restrict your ammunition count, which actually kind of turns your gun into a sniper rifle with uh, very few ammo before reloading and a lot of damage. One other thing uh, you might have uh, thought of uh, when I presented the electricity and how it works on the boss is actually, yes, each instance of electricity will put a little of, uh, a little of um, value inside the stun gauge. So the more bullets you have when using electricity and the faster you build up this gauge and the faster you stun the boss, which works very well when all these bullets uh, trigger bounces and explosions of electricity that you'll get to see inside this gameplay. This is not an FPS player. Maybe it shows, I don't know. The player is very methodical. They try to take out all the seekers uh, one after the other instead of focusing on the boss. So that was one more example, and we have a last for you, which we actually discussed a lot about whether we should show it to you or not, because it might be nausea-inducing, because it's from someone that actually plays FPSs and tried to really break the game. So they found out that the dash actually cancels gravity, which is what we expected. We just didn't ex expect it that use of it. So they can basically fly around and it requires aiming up to fly and aiming down to shoot at the enemies. So it's going to be very quick. <laughs> you can also find that, yes, this player went directly for rocket jumping also. So you put an explosion under your feet and it propels you into the air. You are completely allowed to close your eyes if you don't feel well. Uh, please do it if it gets too fast.
thank you for bearing this. Uh, I kind of wish they found an hardest, uh, the hardest eating bullet as well, so it would have been faster. Uh, if you've ever seen some Overwatch compilation of Genji, this might have been a joke to you, but... Uh, no? <laughs> no! <laughs> Zeri, thank you for your attention. So I guess I'll just present the team. So the core team is on your left, yes. On your left, uh, we've got Rugved, myself, and Theophil as GDs. Clément as the audio guy, he did everything, including the guitar solo you heard. Uh, <laughs> Alex as UX, and Theo and Brice for the programming aspects, and for the art we have the team of three, Federico, Miguel, and Dorian. And for the consulting team, thanks to Guillaume and Axel for being project managers, and we hired two M1s to help us, Arthur and Antoine, and the best for at last, uh, Clara as UI. <laughs> Thank you for your attention, and don't remember you can come see us at the at the stand afterwards. Thank you. Congrats to the team. So yes, I see your first question. Uh, hello. So very much. Firstly, I must congratulate you on nailing two things. So your game is a hybrid. You're making a FPS roguelike and you're doing, or roguelites, I'm sorry, you're doing two important things. You're making an incredible game feel as um, heard when uh, the stack, um, the stun effect stacks. And um, much more of a roguelike thing, or roguelite, the game is breakable. So that's insane. The way the, the, the stack goes up and up as it probably should not, that's amazing. I have three questions very quickly. Do you plan on addressing the breakability of the game? Because if you do not or do it maybe wrongly, you risk the player progressing too quickly. Um, would you say that your aesthetic is influenced by, uh, for instance, Bloodborne, uh, specifically the, um, the haze level? And um, do you have any other ideas than the bullets regarding meta progression? Okay, so yeah, uh, about the breakability. Uh, so the thing is that we have for now 22 components. Each one has just a ton of variables. So, and we didn't have like only so much time to, to balance it. And we would need some very insane Excel, Excel stuff to, to just preview what's possible. So it's for now it's completely breakable. We will still have breakable, but a bit less, we hope so. And for the rest, uh, we'll let Rugben answer some. Yes, um, just uh, uh, regarding the breakability of the game, we will balance it, but we will only balance it as to not ruin the game. But we still want to keep the game a bit breakable because, let's be real, the players like to break the game. The internal satisfaction you get by breaking a game, it's, it's uh, skyrocketing. So we want to keep it a bit breakable. And when it comes to the um, DA, uh, and yeah, for sure, the one of our two references was Dear May Cry and also Bloodborne because we are all three uh, a big player of Bloodborne. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, uh, Morgan, producer at Guerilla. Congratulations! It looks amazing, super fun, and it mostly looks like you had a lot of fun playing it, which is, uh, actually making it, sorry, which is very important. Um, yeah, I, I love the fact that there is so many, so much uh, combination that you can do and there's a potential for replayability and definitely something you can see streamers do and, you know, uh, you still want to play the game and have streamers stream it for you because, you know, they can try different things and stuff like this. There's one thing that I wish could happen if this game happens and stuff. Can the gun talk to me? <laughs> I want him to bully me, to just say when I suck, to criticize my weird combinations, and yeah, I want him to be very mean to me. Uh, is this something that <laughs> can happen or not? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, we, we thought about, about it talking, but uh, we haven't had the time to do it. But also, uh, what we did that when we shoot uh, with the gun, that there's actually a whisper of voices that kind of do the tricks. But uh, yeah, he's not actually talking, but it's more whispering. If I can add from a game design perspective too, we wanted to kind of give agency to the demon itself. So maybe it can go against the player for some cases. We just didn't have the time for it. So we focused on the rest. Hi, uh, Eliza from uh, Ubisoft's uh, research, research Lab in Paris. Um, congratulations, it was a very uh, impressive presentation. Uh, you wanted to do a boss fight and you did it. So congrats on that. Um, however, I, I still think that could, uh, it would have been better to have more enemies. Um, I think part of your experience is going to be against multiple enemies and how the player is, is going to manage all these enemies at the same time. And eh, I'm a bit on my, I'm still a bit hungry about uh, this part of the game. And um, I think it's, it, it's missing this uh, particularly uh, important part of player's experience on this one. So, but still congratulations, was very good to see. Yeah, we kind of agree with you. Like if we had more time, that's what we would, ha we would have done. The we really wanted to experiment with doing a boss because we're only students and this is a, a, such a nice opportunity to try our hands on it right now that we are at Engmin. So we went for it despite all the advices that went against it. Sorry, but we're not sorry. We're happy with what we have, and we hope you're going to be happy to play against it and defeat it, or die to it. Thank you again. A question online, so Odile? Yes, thank you. Um, I, uh, I think I, I, so big improvement on your presentation and then explaining everything. So I think it, it was really great to hear. And uh, just a remark on your um, budget and your production plan. I think you're a little bit, it's not really realistic, uh, all what you plan having a Kickstarter campaign, a procedural generation of levels, a Twitch integration, and all this in a couple of months or one year, or a little bit more than one year. So if you really want to look for a publisher, um, work on this and try to really have a realistic production plan. Uh, to present and also to work on which kind of publisher would be interesting to to work with you. It was a little bit too general for me. Thank you. So yes, it's a bit general right now, but uh, we have all our annexes available. If you want, if you want, we can share it with you. Uh, our all the calculation we did, but. Uh, yeah, that's true. There, there is room for improvement on that, I guess. We tried a bit, uh, how best to estimate the sizing of the team uh, according to the indie production we are, like we aim to be. So we wanted to, uh, we can still get like better sizing, but it's like the estimation we, we got uh, for now. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm from Utah, Madrid. Hello. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I have to say that for the trailer that you saw at the first, uh, there were not so much uh, different bullets flying in that moment, so I think that's a missing opportunity. But for the rest, I have to say that you have come uh, so, well, such a long way from the starting point to what, it is, what, to what the game is now. Now we see the levels. That was a big concern and how the combat works. But at the same time, I have to agree with what, what has been said. Uh, a hero is as good as, as his villain. And we didn't have enough villains or enough combat or enough enemies to try to prove that this gameplay, of course, it will be fun, as we have seen, and we all have love because of the combination, and it's crazy, it, it's good. But maybe we need, uh, our, or the main focus that you now need to focus on, sorry, it's the enemies that can make the experience real, that the combination can work or not. It will also depend on the enemies and if the game is fun or not. Uh, at the same time, um, as a part of accessibility, you need to take into account uh, not just using uh, words and text to try to say like uh, bullets, uh, heavy, 
instead of that you need to rely on icons because that also breaks part of the immersion of the game the or, or the aesthetic. Uh, and I also just wanted to ask you about, yes, uh, community is important, but are you going to make crazy achievements? Because the player that didn't touch the ground, that could be an amazing achievement, like defeating a boss, leaving the ground just one time, or crazy things like that. Uh, I, I don't know, I think that, if you, I don't know if you have think about that, but that could be a really interesting way of uh, encouraging your own community. Uh, yeah, thank you for your feedback. Um, so on the aspect of having more enemies, we agree to, to you. It's a thing we, if we had more, it would be more, it would prove more the concept. Uh, on the achievements, uh, so completely, uh, that's a, a very good direction to go towards. And also we have the, we have, so in in the, so no, it's uh, in the progression of the run, if you remember, at the end of each uh, combat room, you unlock new components to build with. Uh, in this context, we have an unlock tree, uh, that's what we want to do. And if you do special things with special components, uh, you can unlock secrets within this tree. This is also a way to reward this kind of behavior. Uh, hello, Ivan from Zagreb, game designer. Um, I have a question about pacing. The, 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 the first shot of your level uh, featuring this heavy set uh, 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 enemy, the, the first time we, we saw the gun, my, my first thought was transistor FPS, not Hades. Uh, and and uh, this goes to, to, the, to the pacing. I'm not sure why, uh, but um, and it may have to do uh, mainly with the enemy, which is very static and, and uh, uh, ver uh, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a very predictable tempo to it. And it wouldn't be fair to generalize from this one uh, uh, boss that we've seen. But if you want to have all that weapon variety and all the, c uh, all the combinations, and I'm sure we all admire your optimism with regards to the breakability of the game, um, it, it, it has to, as Jaime said, it has to be followed by, by greater variety in reactions of the, of, the, of the enemies. I felt, and this is by no means a criticism, just a way to illustrate, watching this, regardless of the uh, style of play, uh, which resides within the, uh, within the player, when within their decision, I'm not forced to do it. It's, it's, it's almost a skateboarding game. I choose to do it. Uh, I felt as if I was, uh, for example, uh, solving a chess problem on a, uh, while riding a bicycle, you know? So I felt in control all, all of the time. So I, I don't think the, the static enemies are a way to go. It looks great. It won't play great against the variety of weapons. Also, uh, have any of you played Trackmania? Because one of the vectors of your community building is Trackmania. Just, you know, sexy videos of how you, how you solve this. You, you, did, you did feel where we reacted, you know, uh, on the exploit of flying, etc., etc. I'm not sure it's even a roguelike. It doesn't have to be. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you for your feedback and your opinions. Um, when it comes to the example of Trackmania, that is absolutely perfect. Uh, when it comes to Trackmania, it has a huge, uh, huge player base, and they are all very creative. They like to make maps, share with each other, and that is one of our one of our future key selling points. That when it comes to Twitch streaming. Etc. There is a lot of socialization where players can can make their beds. They can share it with each other. They can also challenge each other to complete the mission using this specific bed. And uh, and uh, 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 regarding your last question, uh, which was uh, pardon me, can you please repeat your last question? <laughs> okay, so that that makes me feel better. <laughs> It doesn't have oh, to yes, be roguelike. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. So um, when it comes to why roguelike, because if you if you see at a um, uh, roguelike, it is procedurally generated, and it is almost infinite to play. It never technically ends. But if we go for a more linear format, it is supposed to end one day. And we want the players to keep playing. So that's why the roguelike formula. We have a question online. So, Leonard? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Leonid from Paradox Interactive. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I think you've made something that I want to toy with. Uh, I want to try it and I want to, to see what I can do with it. And I think that's definitely a great sign coming, coming out of your presentation. So th thank you for your presentation and congratulations. Uh, I have a question about it. It's kind of look back to game breakability. Uh, I think in the previous presentation, you mentioned that maybe you would uh, forbid a certain combination. I think today you said you wouldn't. So I'm not totally clear. Uh, if I basically, when you were showcasing what you have, I immediately wonder what would happen if I uh, used a dash call with buckshot. And I really want my screen to split nine ways and have eight duplicate of me playing around, but I don't think that would be very easy to, to make happen. So I'm really interested in how what all you pictures going around these these specific issues, uh, and I have a second question, but it's a yes or no question. I just want to follow up on what Morgan asked because I agree. Uh, we really uh, need the gun to be mean to us and have a sultry voice. And my yes or no question is: Will I be able to romance the gun? Thank you. So. Uh, regarding the yes or no question, I think we would all happily answer yes. Romance is possible. Uh, and coming to the previous question, which is more comprehensive, um, like the example which you mentioned, you have the dash and you also have the shotgun. If the shotgun spreads, then do your body part spread as well? Unfortunately not. Uh, well, even though we were making a really systemic game, we at the back of the mind knew that not everything would be possible. Uh, we, we, we made sure that 99% combinations work with each other, but there was this last 1% which was just not compatible with each other. And I think uh, we will, like, if we try to get more mm, creative, we will find a workaround for this, but mm, that's one thing we accept. Uh, currently, it's not possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just uh, the Godfather comments. You made a good gun for my uh, for my troops. So I'm very happy of your presentation. And uh, li like all the presents I've seen, you made a big uh, big progress. And uh, and also you heard very well what were the advice. You didn't took them all, but you heard, and it's very important. And uh, I had a few questions, but you all already answered. Uh, for me, uh, the gun, uh, of course, the personality of the gun should be uh, increased in the whole game. But for me, it's not about romance. It was a demon, but maybe you can have a romance with a demon. Uh, so, <laughs> but if you had to finish the game, I think it's very important. And my last question, which is not far from the previous question, do you think that it should be interesting to have a multiplayer mode? Well, you don't really necessarily fight against each other, but you f you fight with several players against this the huge uh, big boss. Hello, okay. uh, thank you for your feedback. Um, so, for the multiplayer mode, I think the answer is would be fun totally. Uh, I don't know what you think, yeah, <laughs> but uh, technical for. Programming-wise, I'm not sure they will be very happy. <laughs> it is it? <laughs> but yeah. I mean, we can let that to modders to do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, technical feasibility is still to explore, but definitely something is to be done with this idea. Uh, also, uh, because we are a first-person shooter, uh, we will have to have a lot of more modeling, different modeling uh, animations for the full body, so I think it's not rentable, I think. But it will be interesting as well, I think. Hello guys, uh, congrats on the work. I'm pretty happy to see that you managed to actually do a boss, uh, even if I, I had some doubts, but, uh, but uh, congrats on that. 
congrats as well on the um, architecture kit. Um, it's fairly well done and fairly well exploited, so that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, beside that, I have some remarks. Um, I kind of um, regret that you have uh, you have a very monochromatic game, even for the enemy. And I think you have a missed opportunity cre to create a visual language, you know, like for weak points, uh, for this kind of stuff. Uh, since, I mean, like there you have a one big boss, but in a room with plenty of enemies, you need to be able to read very clearly the, your weak points. So I think uh, this is uh, something to think about. Um, and I still need to play the game, all right? But from the video, um, I feel that uh, your game lacks impact and gun feel. And like even for the, uh, the powers of the enemy, like the laser of the boss feels kind of weak. It makes like a <laughs> like this. Uh, and it's not like uh, it's not big laser. It's like a tiny thingy. I mean, it's not really epic and impressive compared to the size of the boss. So um, you have a very very good core mechanic like the bullet crafting, no doubt. But you really need to think about what the player will do with it and what he will do when he actually use it. And because like this is really really important, and I feel that is a bit underdeveloped uh, compared to the core mechanics. Okay, so I'll answer first for the enemies because it's uh, like a critique uh, that almost all of you uh, said in one way or the other. Yes, the we did the enemies last actually, so this is why um, they are maybe lacking in shape, language, color, number. And this is all because we put a lot of efforts inside of the controller and the actual systems of building MO. Uh, like we said, we didn't forbid anything that wasn't without any sense. Like we tried to balance it also, even though it's completely breakable. Uh, but yes, the actually the boss has been designed with uh, constraints in mind. Like we don't have much time. How how do we do a boss when we don't have much time? So this is why it uses lasers that much. This is why it doesn't move, and this is why it only dashes, for example. And we try to make it interesting despite all this lack of resource of or effort that just because we were at the end of the project already. Um, also, for uh, the question of like color palette and all, uh, is due to a lack of time. Like we have at least, I think, one week to do like the lighting and the level art uh, after receiving like the modeling and stuff. Um, and it's also hard to make like an old art action with all this kind of elemental uh, attacks. Uh, from diverse enemies, and so I think it's because of that. Uh. Also, because it's a uh, roguelike, and we will have like three areas. Uh, it's not for me at least, not particularly fully bad that one area has a very like condensed uh, palette, and then the next one will have an air condensed palette, and then the other one will have like very different uh, fillings. I don't know if this is part of the answer, but. Okay, uh, no. <laughs> okay, so last but not least for the weapon field. Um, given it's generated depending on the content of the bullets, sometimes it's insanely, it's too much, and sometimes it's very low, and it's hard to control, and we tried, but yeah, there are some <laughs> improvements to do completely. Um, so hello, Aurélien, Escape Games, congratulations, for real. Um, two quick game design clarification questions. Uh, one, how do you plan to manage health? And like, well, that's my question. And my second question would be, uh, what would be like the, the long-term motivation uh, about like actually finishing the game? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, is there some kind of story, even a short one, like in Enter the Gungeon or something? Um, that's my second question. Okay, so uh, for health first, uh, 
as you've seen, it's very basic at the moment. You, you can just take damage and you die when it's empty. Uh, we, uh, because we didn't think of the progression that much, uh, yeah. Uh, is we just meant it to be ba basic, and it, and it is. We all agree to that. Uh, the question we uh, we were asking ourselves were: Do you, is there a way to replete your health gauge? Uh, the answer might have been yes, but we didn't integrate any component that has life still incorporated, though we thought about them. And also between rooms, maybe there are ways to heal. We we asked those questions to ourselves, and we didn't answer them. I'm sorry. And lastly, for the progression, uh, yes, we've, s we've thought about a story, uh, especially with, um, we were inspired by Hades on this point, where there is multiple ways of finishing the game, and depending on how you finish it, what build you have, and what happened with the demon during this whole run, uh, maybe there is a different end, and maybe these ends make sense together, like you have to do them in a specific order to unlock new unlocks. And yeah, that's it. And that's it. That's it. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations <laughs> again. <laughs> and let's welcome the last team of uh, this afternoon, Duke Tech Team. And in the meantime, you have your gain. Thank you. That's very loud. Let me preserve your hearing. Let's go. This was a hard day. I just finished my shift and my third whiskey, and I was wondering was I, why I was thinking out loud in front of an audience instead of being in my office. There was this other mystery that uh, kept haunting my mind. Who was this detective Quackers? I once dreamt that he was in fact three dogs under a trench coat, and that made me laugh. But yet the mystery stayed unsolved. I think I need to get back to the beginning of all of this. I'm Clément, game and narrative designer, and welcome to Doctective. Now, before we start, do you know the difference between three dogs under a trench coat and a plane? There's no difference. Now, before we actually start, I need to stop this music because it's going to stay otherwise. <laughs> it's not a music. Uh, this can keep going. I mean, I don't mind. That's great music. Made by Gre Grégoire, our sound designer. There we go. So yeah, Duck Detective, a game about three ducks under a trench coat that solved mysteries. The main idea behind this game was to make a game that had both quirky controls and weird mechanics of moving and gathering clues, and also a fulfilling investigation system. You know, in lots of uh, classic investigation games, uh, the game kind of drives you towards the conclusion that they want to achieve, well, the game wants to achieve. And in this game, we wanted to make a, a system that allowed the player to make their own solutions, their own hypothesis. And with the quirky controls, uh, where you have to balance your dogs, we'll come back to that later, and uh, that investigation system, we wanted a funny story, but intrinsic, a comedy, 
but with interesting story. Uh, in a nutshell, our game is targeted at PC or Switch and for 15 to 35 play, uh, aged players. We, want, we don't want to target new players. They have to be somewhat uh, used to playing games. And uh, it's not recommended for first time experience. You'll see why later. And also an affinity towards original, independent and narrative games, of course. Now, the egg or the duck. Who came first? Obviously, our inspirations came first. Uh, we have a few of them right here. Return of the Obra Dinn for the investigation system, Phoenix Wright for the funny story, and Detective Gr Grimoire for the mechanics again. And some of these games are really comedic, like Phoenix Wright. Some of them are less comedic, like Obra Dinn. But you see that there's a duck, so I suppose there's a joke in, in it. I don't know. And some of them are more or less complex. We aim to have lots of comedy and a bit of complexity and thoroughness in the mechanics. Uh, now that you know the basics, let's hear Lea about uh, the law of uh, our game. So to us human birds are just birds, like it's tiny flying creatures, nothing to be afraid of. But hiding inside our world, there is the secret society of birds. They are as intelligent as us, they are organized, they even have tiny pubs with tiny stools and they call them crowbar. And they also have a police, a bird police, and uh, a very good health care also. Uh, they yeah. are very organized. Um, so they need to stay hidden from us because we could be a threat to their tiny little world. So that's why the first rule in the bird world is to stay secret. We don't have to know that bird as as intelligent as us. So this is a classic neighborhood uh, made by our uh, Phil agent, Solen. So um, it's a classic neighborhood. It's cartoonish in its shapes. But the atmosphere is kind of mysterious, kind of scary, because something bad happened here in this peaceful neighborhood. For the first time in history, a bird has killed a human. This threatened the secret of the bird, because if human can learn that birds are sentient and can kill, there is no doubt that humans will exterminate all of them. So, to solve this mystery and protect the secret, Pelicano, the chief officer of the bird police, gathered a unique team to solve this mystery. So, let's meet them. In our uh, duck dream team, first of all, you have Becky, our main character. She is an investigation journalist and she was uh, recommended to Pelicano by someone. Uh, she's not a policeman, she has nothing to do in the police because she's a journalist, but he puts, it, he puts her in the, in the group. Then you have Barry, the detective. He, he is the most experienced uh, detective in the bird police, which doesn't mean he's competent. And his only goal is to find a culprit. And finally you have Buck. He's just uh, the chief son, because there has to be someone on the bottom of that pile of ducks. So yeah, I think he chose the best people to handle that quite exceptional case. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit on an artistic direction made by uh, Solen and Santiago, our artists. Uh, first of all, the environment. Uh, I think it looks really cool, personally. Uh, we, it stems from uh, references such as Sam and Max and all the cartoons where he had this really detailed environment with still a cartoonish uh, uh, tone with really exaggerated shapes and broken shapes and also strong lightnings that's a common trope in detective fiction. Uh, with that you have jazz music made by Grégoire once again uh, who really brings that uh, environment to, uh, to make a really good feel I mean and uh, also a mix of realistic sound design and musical sound design. Uh, then we have the characters, and you have here the model of our uh, fellow duck detective, uh, which is three ducks under a trench coat, should I, rem uh, should I remind you? Um, and so for the characters, we have the birds on one side and the humans on the other side. The birds are, are kind of anthropomorphic with just the face that's anthropomorphic. It's less than, for example, the Looney Tunes. And for the humans, they're really, uh, they really have their own personality, but they all look a little bit dumb because well, you have this thing on the on your left uh, um, that roams around, and they have no clue that it's a dog and not a human. 
where it's clearly obvious. And also, as you heard before, audio gibberish in the dialogues. Now, before we go further, uh, maybe we can stop that um, uh, night ambience, because otherwise, maybe it will make you sleep. It makes me. There we go. Let's see our trailer. I failed my joke. <laughs> so, it, it <laughs> If you want to see it for real, it's parked right there. I think it was a great uh, uh, expense of money for the project. <laughs> now that the important things are sorted out, let's see our teaser. <laughs> so, uh, you're probably asking yourself right now, uh, what the duck is this? Uh, so, don't worry, you will know everything you need to know about being a uh, bird inside the human world in a few minutes. So, what will be your mission as a duck detective? In the first phase, you have to find clue, obviously. So, look around, find a way to get the clue and pick it. Then you will enter the second phase, making an hypothesis. Using the clue and the information you get, to try to create hypotheses that will answer one of Pelicano's questions about the crime. So it seems easy for a great detective like you. But remember that you are three ducks under a trench coat, so you are very, very clumsy. So collision with something, or walking upstairs, or slippery surface, you will start to trip. And if you start to trip in front of a human, that will be very dangerous for your secret. If you start tripping, human will get suspicious. So that's not really good for your cover. <coughs> but if you human get suspicious too many times, or worst, if you fall in front of them, then they know. They know your secret, you failed, and you have to go back to the start of the level. So now you are able to understand the challenge of picking clue. Let's now talk about your second mission, making hypothesis. We've teased you and we've teased you about that hypothesis system, but how does it work? Well, first, uh, you get a clues. Here is an example of random clues that uh, we just put there because. Uh, and a question from the chief, what happened to the canary? That's a good question. Well, to form an hypothesis, you have to link two clues together with a bit of sentence. For example, the bedroom window has forgotten the black feathers. Yeah, I mean, that's a bit weird. Uh, when you make an hypothesis that makes no sense, the game tells you, and so you just have to try again. It tells you that doesn't make sense. Okay, let's try something else. The canary has eaten the suction cup. Do you think that's an hypothesis that's valid or that's invalid? What do you think? Yeah, that's invalid. I mean, that could be possible with a lot of time I mean, with a, lot of with a lot of time and effort, it could be possible, but we'll just say that it isn't. Uh, the cage has eaten the canary. Yeah, in, in a metaphorical sense, you could say that it's true, but we count it as invalid. Yeah, that is very, very wrong. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah, that's true, but... That's out the scope of this vertical slice. <laughs> Maybe for the full game, though. <laughs> yeah, that's a good hypothesis. The canary has been attacked by an unknown suspect. That makes sense, I guess. Yes. Uh, and now that you have an hypothesis, you have to provide proof or evidence to turn it into a conclusion, to transform it. So, for example, you could, one, you could add as a proof one of uh, those clues. So, the black feathers, the broken cage, all the bloody yellow feathers. I'm not saying this to sound British. That's because they have blood on it. Um, well, now you're ready to go into the world and be a dog detective in a human world. Let's see how it goes. Quack, 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 quack. 
Let's ignore the first seconds. Now, for those of you that want to keep the surprise and want to actually play the game, now it's the time to look away.
And that's it. <laughs> now you've seen how one playthrough goes, so we're going to show you five more. No, that's not true. Um, this player decided that Annie did the crime, but you might find otherwise if you play the game for real. Each player can draw their own conclusions. That's me again. Um, we just wanted to tell you a bit more about the story. So you've discovered our three characters, the settings, the crime, uh, but maybe you want to learn more about what happens after that vertical slice in the actual game. Well, you have the first act where basically Pelicano sends you on uh, investigations. Uh, so you find that Annie may be the culprit, so you go to investigate her. And then uh, you find that someone else may be the culprit, so you go to investigate them. That's about eight levels. Then you find the actual culprit, the one who did the murder, eight levels later. Uh, but you discover that he's a hit bird or a hitman. Uh, and so he has been paid by someone else to, well, kill the human. And that's very unsettling. So you say that to Pelicano, we found who killed the, the human. And Pelicano closes the case. Now that it's become way more complicated, he tells Becky that he doesn't trust her to finish it because it's now more complicated than what they thought. So Becky has one more failure and she goes away. She gives up. She go live in a pond like a regular duck, eats breadcrumbs, and swim and do whatever ducks do. But then at the beginning of the second act, uh, a character comes to her. It's the sidekick of the big crow that you have er heard of during the gameplay. And uh, he says that his boss is, well, that's a bit of a spoiler, but anyways, uh, his, uh, his boss uh, is really not happy with uh, the fact that someone killed a human and tries to uncover the secrets for the humans. Because if the humans discover the secret, well, then he cannot traffic seeds anymore. So he hires the ducks, and, uh, and you go back for 10 more levels of finding the actual suspect under the protection of the big crow. And at the end of the second act, you find who is the actual suspect. The culprit, sorry. Then you have four more levels to find where he is, he's hiding. That's well, we don't have the actual suspect's uh, art, but yeah. Uh, four levels, and then the final confrontation where you beat him and stuff happens, and then the conclusion where everyone is happy and it's the end. So that's roughly how the story would go uh, according to what we wrote. Uh, and then uh, what happens after the vertical, vertical slice? So there are a few features that we were not able to put in the vertical slice. So uh, first, we want that in the final guide, you will be able to uh, examine each clue with one of the birds, one of your choice. So each duck has its own experiences and memories, so they can give different comments on the clue. Sometimes it will be relevant, sometimes it will be just for fun. But if you are curious enough to listen to the ducks, they might give you an information that will be helpful during the hypothesis making phase. So later in the game, as we say, Becky uh, go back to the wildlife and become a regular ducks that swim uh, in the pond. Um, at this point, she acquire a new ability to be a duck, to transform to a duck. So when she will go back on track with her fellows, they know we'll be able to turn into ducks to investigate. So it's open new places, new challenge and new opportunities for the gamers. So for those of you wondering, the pond level is just one level. We just we don't do that for 10 levels. That would be too much. Eating breadcrumbs is, well, not interesting. Uh, now that you know how the game plays and what is the game, let's see how we make the game. So we talked a bit about uh, our main target. Uh, as we said, it's uh, 
gamers uh, from uh, 15 to uh, 35 plus year old and uh, which have already played video games. Uh, Detective is not recommended for a, a first gaming experience, but for uh, players with more veterancy. It is designed for players who enjoy both challenging mechanics and an interesting na narration. Uh, for example, they will enjoy puzzles more uh, if solving them definitely impacts the story. We uh, identified uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of competitors on the market we want to reach uh, and extracted three main competitors from them. Tungle Tower, because uh, it is a little game with a lot of humor on a complex investigation system. Sam and Max, because uh, of the silly universe they develop, their sense of staging and untitled Google's game, because you play uh, in the game, you have to infiltrate uh, the human world um, uh, as uh, we have to do this uh, in our game. Those productions has are close to us, and we can expect to have the same kind of uh, uh, achievements at the, at the end. In terms of audience, those games go from uh, uh, 100,000 players to more than 1 million. We identified, uh, we identified a medium target at uh, 500,000 users, which is what uh, has made uh, this episode of uh, Sam and Max. So now you see our main competitors, so what would you buy the game and why people will buy the game? So first, because of the story. Yeah, I'm sure that now you know to you want to know uh, the end of the story, so who killed the human? And you will feel like a true detective because of our mechanics of making hypotheses. There is a lot of humor and a silly universe to discover. And you will meet a lot of different characters. Uh, some are birds, some are human and they all have their personality. So it will be like being the hero of a thriller and a comedy at the same time, like the perfect mix between a Hitchcock movie and Scooby-Doo. But Leah, what Hitchcock movie? Uh, you know, the, the one with the... 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 the, the yeah, yeah, it was Jurassic Park. Yeah, this one, the big, big bird, big old bird. Yeah. Uh, doesn't that sound amazing? So how many birds do we need to make this game and how many birds does it take to remove a light bulb? Well, for this game, we need 13, 13 birds for 16 months. That's what we calculated, so a bit more than what we are here, uh, which would make the cost of one level to 34K approximately for about 25 levels at a to total cost of uh, 860K and maybe more levels later, who knows? We have worked those last month on the main insertities of the project and we know how to do every main feature of the game. So the tripping system, the investigation system, the interaction system and the direct system are all mastered. It has allowed us to finally learn how to make uh, the first level and to have a proper production pipeline for uh, the rest of the levels that uh, will have to be done. So here the level will be our production unit. Our strategy is to have uh, every for level a phase of playtest and uh, QA to be able to ensure that av at every step of the development uh, the required level of quality and to uh, it will be reached and to avoid as much as possible uh, to uh, have a, a technical depth. Uh, the production in itself is supposed to last for 12 months and the release month 14. We want to keep resources after the release to ensure level of quality with two patches and everything ends at uh, 16th month. So uh, here you can see uh, about what correspond the production units. Uh, we can see that we know how to make a level in two weeks. Uh, and um, uh, you also uh, be able to see the cost. Uh, this knowledge allow us to uh, be able to scope the project according to the new production concern that we will have and the one that can happen during the production process. This way, we can also deal with uncertainties during uh, this phase two. We uh, have uh, some hypotheses uh, about uh, in, in a way to evaluate uh, the kind of uh, amount of income we can have uh, from the game. Uh, the first hypothesis is that we target Steam as our main distribution plat platform. We target six months of sales and we are edited by a publisher who works within this studio and that will handle uh, communication. We talked about uh, uh, some publisher like Big Ben or uh, De Devolver. So what are the output uh, of uh, this? Uh, it will be a target audience as, uh, at uh, 500,000 unique users with a median price at 10 euro. It will allow an income uh, of more than 2 million of euro. It means a, a return on uh, investment close to 2x 
And this is a medium expectation, so it's in the case if the game is not uh, a total failure, uh, but also if the game is not a total success regarding to what is happening uh, on the, the market. Now, it's time to wrap up. So we know who this Detective Quackers is. We know how to play the game. We know how to fail a joke. Well, uh, the game, our game, uh, I forgot what I wanted to say. Let's go back. <laughs> uh, our game uh, really has this balance between quirky controls and fulfilling investigation system, where the player want, uh, can make their own solutions. Why did I say that you might want to play the game yourself? Because in that level that you've seen, there are multiple uh, outcomes possible depending on what you think happened. Like if you think and he's innocent, you can tell the game and it works. You can finish the level. Uh, and added to that, the funny and, uh, and interesting story that we hope uh, to make, uh, I think makes uh, a kind of a, a good hole and uh, we'll, uh, voila, <laughs> here we go, it's a bit late, uh, and we'll uh, let the player um, maybe solve the case. Now, what about you? Do you think you could quack the case? Thank you for listening. <laughs> now, Clément Orlandini as a game designer. Léa Ropion, Guillaume David, uh, Hugo Varion Sayan, Grégoire Monesma, Solène Pobel, Santiago Revetria, Noé Simon et Clara. So who wants to quack first? I know I've done it already, but yes, thank you, Louis. Uh, Louis, associate producer at Asobo. This is the third time uh, we see your presentation, and thank you very much because we had a lot of fun uh, you making really great joke and uh, you speak very well even if you repeat some joke like Jacques Chirac of course even the last one yes but uh, thanks you you have a good concept it was clear we we understand qu quickly where you want to go and uh, yeah let's make it happen now Uh, hello, so Milan, marketing and communication for Indies. I just wanted to congratulate you on some things, like you understand, like instead of saying you will have a funny game, you just have to show it. And this is something a lot of actually developers don't understand because everyone is able to say we will have a funny game and not so many people are, are at the end doing a funny game. So yeah, congrats on that. Well, Jaime from Madrid, and I know that I will also repeat myself, but what the duck, man. <laughs> you crack it again. This was ducktastic, and from the first time, your ideas had so much potential. At the end, you have been able to show it. You have been able to see how it will work. I think that uh, we all can agree that uh, maybe it has some things to police, that maybe the mechanic and the consequences of falling uh, are not very clear, but at least we see the problems, we see the obstacles, we see the main mechanics, we see the hypothesis, the famous hypothesis system, and it works. It works. It opens so many possibilities, so many different ways to quark the cases. So I think that uh, you have been able to show the main mechanics to show that they work, that they need police, but that your project, that well, that we can trust your project. And also I think that 
it could also have potential for a game for children. Maybe you will have to make like an adaptation for some of the languages and some terms and some jokes, but it could have a very big potential for being a game that could be also enjoyed by children and their parents because one of the best ways to make games for children are, as also happens in movies, are movies that can be watched by children but also enjoyed by the parents. So I think that there you have a really good target or a good, uh, really good possibility. And I don't know if you have uh, thought about that. But again, above anything else, congratulations. Um, quick question. So. What's your plan for when you get a, um, an hypothesis but it's not the right one? Well, it's not the law-wise correct one? Are you, do you have a plan to, act, I don't know, bottleneck the story at some point to make everything right? Or what's, what's your plan for that? Because it seems strange that you can advance without having the full solution. So I'll be curious to know what's your plan. Yeah, we thought, uh, hang on. <laughs> Um, we <laughs> thought about this, uh, what happens if you have a wrong conclusion? We had a few hypotheses about that, and I think what happens is maybe the order in which you investigate the suspects. So if you say uh, Annie was the culprit, then you go to uh, the victim's apartment to investigate on Annie. If you say Big Crow is the, s is the culprit, then you go into a crowbar to uh, investigate. So I think that's how it, w it would work. And also you may have pivot moments in the story where you have to make that master hypothesis. You take back everything that you know from the previous levels and you have to say, okay, this is the culprit. And if you say the, the wrong culprit, maybe you have like a fake end uh, ending and you can go back and try again. Uh, so those are a few hypotheses on what could happen. All right, cool, thanks. Great, uh, great job, great job. I know it's the end of the day, but do you have some more comments, questions? Yes, reaction. So just the time the mic comes, please. Hi, so I'm very lucky because for me, it's the first time I'm seeing this and oh, this is so charming. I've been laughing the entire time from the uh, environment to the soundtrack to the writing. It's very, very cool. And um, the only thing I want to uh, talk about is the production plan, because I would really like this game to happen. And the production plan is very, very uh, scary, in my humble opinion. How do you make a character in a week? <laughs> I don't know, but uh, this, uh, this is like uh, something I would rework uh, for this game to, to happen. Otherwise, just so charming, it's lovely, congratulations, it's amazing. Thanks. Um, it's a really nice game. Now, I, uh, you are, you're doing a lot of writing in the game, you have a lot of dialogue, much more than we have seen before, and the, the comedy aspect is in that dialogue. I, I hear, and I, I myself, I laugh when I read, ha <laughs> ha And I just think that this is where you, uh, you really need to, uh, I don't know who writes the dialogue, probably, yeah. yes, okay. You, <laughs> you have to uh, make it, sometimes it's like there's a little too much, it's going around and around, but that's also funny. But if it keeps on being the same thing, you have to lift it up to new levels of fun, somehow. I'm not saying I uh, understand n how to do it, I'm just saying that it has to be changing as the game moves along, so it keeps on being surprising and funny, and not being too much like first this bird is saying that, and then the blah, 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 blah. But you have a great uh, ammunition in that way of, of uh, making the game. Thank you.
So I don't see no, m no more questions, no more comments, no, m no more reaction. I think all the people here wants to play the games now. So maybe we're going to finish the day now. Thanks and congrats again, the last team. I just wanted to add quickly that for those of you who speak French, we also have a French version, so you can play it. Uh. Yes, so uh, Stefan wants to say something. No, I, I think it's the last time well, when I meet you, maybe uh, next year when you will get your diploma. Yes, uh, so I was very happy for these days. All the presentations were great. I d I and I, uh, I will go to see you in uh, the box, but I was very happy to be the grandfather. I have ducks, guns, and everything I need as a grandfather. So uh, I, I wish you uh, a very nice, happy, and uh, interesting internship. And uh, we will see us together when you will get your master. Thank you, Stefan. So before we, st we finish and wrap up everything, I would like to invite all the, all the students to come down and to have a great uh, applause because you deserve it. Thank you for the great job you've made. <laughs> and while, while they are coming down, I would like to say also thank you to the technical staff. Javier, Florian, thank you. Thanks for... Uh, Thanks. Also, thanks to the administrative staff. Uh, thank you to May, in in especially. <laughs> I would like also to thank the jury and uh, thank you for being here today. It's great to see uh, the the whole uh, amphitheater full again and thanks for being there. Thanks for the people following online as well. It's not uh, the same, but uh, still we really appreciate you to be there too. So thank you. <laughs> and the final words come to Axel. And a big thanks to Catherine. Thank, thank you all. Without you, the engine will, wouldn't be what it is now. And uh, uh, it's great. It's great to see all those projects. And uh, I will leave Stefan to have the final words. <laughs> I, 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 I thought I had already the final word, so I said, quack, 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 quack. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>